as a thumbs up. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for attending the meeting of the Hampshire Police and Crime Panel. Welcome to the members of the public joining us. This meeting is being webcast on YouTube and hosted on Hampshire County Council's website. The press and members of the public are also permitted to film and broadcast this meeting. By entering and remaining at the meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and recorded and to the possible use of those images and recordings for broadcasting purposes. Going through just our basic housekeeping, fire alarm arrangements, if there is a continuous alarm sounding at any point in the meeting, proceed out the doors at the back and towards reception, leave the building and congregate outside the Great Hall. Um, toilet facilities are available nearby, just out in the corridor to the right. There is a hearing loop, this room is fitted, and um, if you need that, please turn your hearing aid on to the T setting. Could I remind everybody to please switch their phones to silent or turn them off? That would be lovely, thank you very much. Um, moving on to uh, apologies for absence. Uh, I've got apologies from the New Forest District Council representative and from uh, Councillor Joy. Uh, I think that's the only apologies that we've got, unless anybody else has got them. I'm hoping the other members that are currently absent will just be late. Moving on to item two, declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations they wish to make? No, none, thank you very much. Moving then on to the minutes of the previous meeting, which are on pages three to eight. Any comments, or are we happy to accept them as an accurate recording? I see lots of nods, have we agreed? Thank you very much, members. Then we move on to item four, which is questions and deputations. I'm pleased to welcome Ms. Theresa Skelton and Mr. Stephen George, who made requests to give deputations under items eight and nine of our, our agenda today. The deputies will have five minutes each to speak and will be told when they have one minute remaining. Whilst there will be no response to the matter spoken upon today, we do thank you both for attending and speaking to us. So if I could call Miss Skelton first. Thank you. When you're ready, do go ahead. Good morning, councillors. It is good to see new faces on this panel as it is to have a PCC who is more open and approachable to members of the public. Thank you, Donna. As many of you may know, I have stood several times for election to both city and county give you his side of the story. The lady concerned is available any time to give any of you hers publicly, if you wish. The transparency problem perhaps seems not to have gone away. The Hampshire Chronicle on the 4th of November reported a meeting of the complaint subcommittee from which public and media were excluded, chaired by Mr Stewart, this was challenged by the Local Democracy Reporting Service. In 2017, a full year after the lady mentioned above had had any contact with the panel, an action to obtain an ASBO was launched against her in the name of Hampshire County Council. It ran to nothing in the Civil Division of the Winchester Courts after anything up to £70,000 of taxpayers' money had been wasted. It relied partly on a witness statement of dubious veracity at several points, signed by Mr Dave Stewart. Only now with disclosure was it revealed how derelict the complaint subcommittee's alleged investigation of the lady's original complaint against the PCC had been. Mr Stewart said in his statement against her that he had been satisfied with it. A second objection to Mr Stewart's appointment is that he had lost his democratic mandate. He was voted out of his Isle of Wight council seat in May. Should people who have evidently lost the confidence of the voting public be allowed to return to paid public office by the back door in this way? Should such a person ever be entertained for corruption, especially to a position as influential as chair of this subcommittee, which could uh, significantly impact policing in this county. As a general principle, should this position not be reserved for an elected councillor, preferably one who is not a former police officer? 
Finally, there arises an extremely thorny question which I, which I suggest this panel simply cannot ignore. It relates to Mr Stewart's past record as a serving police officer. I have a signed statement, which hopefully you'll all get, um, a signed statement from Mr Julian King, who served under him. This describes some of Mr Stewart's actions as a detective inspector in Isle of Wight CID. You will note from this statement that Mr Stewart appears to have undermined the investigation of a paedophile suspect. Whilst Mr Stewart must be given every opportunity to clear his name... One minute. One, sorry? All right, one yes. Preferably not in any way at the public expense, it is surely wholly unacceptable that he should hold any official position until he has been able to do so, even if there was no other objection to his appointment. Mr King is available now and at any time to answer all your other complaints subcommittee at that time operated. OK, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Miss Gilson. Thank you. Th these things should be considered before and making this decision today. If I could ask Mr George to speak, please. Mr George, in your own time, when you're ready, Hello, I'll everybody. start the timer. So I'm deaf, so I have difficulty hearing you. Um, police and corruption, two words which should not be in the same sentence, not only are they, but reports of police corruption are now being repeated all over the United Kingdom. A more audacious piece of criminal behaviour against Jason Packer, who I'm naming with his permission, which was politically motivated, I have never seen, than which was perpetrated in 2014. It destroyed his reputation and made him a target for physical attack by outraged members of the public. As you are the outward face, of Hampshire Police and other forces to the public, we undertake to try to stamp out this corruption. All those organisations meant to help have neither helped nor been helpful. They have, in fact, helped to cover it up. A file has been handed to Donna Jones, who's been very kind and helpful towards me, which includes our case. Believe me, none of us are safe if this level of corruption continues to flourish as it has. I leave you with a quote from the Prison News. Keep up the good work, this is talking about me, your story needs to be told, everyone should stop and listen. It could happen to anyone. The hidden Hancock files scared me to death and broke my heart in equal measure. And many of you received this. This is the story of what actually happened with all the evidence in it showing that Mr Packer was indeed innocent and it was a setup. We're asking for your help because no one else will, and we simply cannot afford to go the, down the legal route. We've wasted thousands of pounds trying to get help, and somebody has lent us money, which is completely um, unfair on him because we're not in a position to pay him back. So we're asking you to help us um, fight this and for other people, because the floodgates were open. I know so many people who've suffered similar Thank you. Thank you, Mr. George. Um, thank you both for sharing your comments um, and spending your time with us today. You are welcome, of course, to remain and observe the rest of the meeting um, today. So moving on, if we may, panel, to item five, Chairman's announcements, which I have a series of. Uh, the Vice Chairman and I recently attended the annual conference for the Police, um, Fire and Crime Panels. And I'm just going to ask um, Dave here to give us a, a summary of, of what happened at the conference. Thank you, Chair. Just to make sure you can hear me okay. <clears throat> so this was a conference held at Warwick University um, and was the annual uh, meeting of the police and crime panels with representatives from across the country. Um, the meeting was opened by Christine Goldstraw, OBE, who is chair of the Nottinghamshire Police and Crime Panel. There was a presentation by Jonathan 
and I credit Ivasan, who's from the PCP at Humberside, on the Home Office review that is underway, um, highlighting a number of points. Politics should have no role in PCPs. PCP is a critical friend of the Police and Crime Commissioner, um, keen to avoid unnecessary churn of the panel. Um, the panels are not there just to scrutinise, but um, to scrutinise the PCC, not the Chief Constable. Um, that financial responsibilities will pass to the PCC in increasing levels, and that the PCPs will receive increased responsibilities <coughs> in due course relating to fire and potentially prisons. There was then a presentation by Paul Grady from Grant Thornton, um, talks of the role again around challenge and support, um, talked about the budget in particular, and this was not about a veto, more about influencing the shape of its format. Um, <clears throat> there's a question to ask about whether scrutiny of the police will be sufficient and um, endorse the view not to have too much churn in the panels. Finally, there was a presentation, <coughs> excuse me, by a Dr. Rick Muir, about M-U-I-R. He was reflecting on the rise and fall and rise again of importance of the crime agenda, the right balance between local and national issues, a reflection on the balance between the responsibilities of the Chief Constable and the Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, he wasn't sure that the review would settle this issue, and I should point out this review is um, being done by the Police Foundation, of which he is um, a lead member. It's not the government review, but it will inform government. Um, <clears throat> this review is in two parts. First, the challenge, and second, the response. 75% um, of what they've looked at so far is into traditional crime. Um, they could see three changes, fraud, environmental, including pandemics, and the social environment. <clears throat> and there was questions around, do the police have the capacity to deal with all these changes? Um, crime needs not just to be the responsibility of the police only. Crime prevention needs wider ownership. Um, a need for clarity on what the role of the police should be going forward. Capability in review looks at the system capability. Um, there's comments around police training needing review such as the interpersonal skills element, high investment in technology, national procurement is being looked at as a more cost-effective approach, um, leadership, senior leaders and supervisors, um, and this whole review, um, st strong strategic centre to it required, particularly around digital areas. Um, there are various comments at the meeting, and um, that review is due to report in the near future, and I think for panel members and probably for the public, the opportunity to have a look at that piece of work, which is quite in-depth, uh, would be worthwhile. So that's a strategic review by the Police Foundation being led by a Dr. Muir, M-U-I-R. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dave. Um, just to build on that, I think it's, it's potentially really useful for us to think about how that and some of the things that were coming out as far as how the landscape are changing will potentially change either the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner, the, the role of the panel, or perhaps some of the things that we may need to scrutinise in a slightly different way if they're coming more directly from the Home Office via the Police and Crime Commissioner and their role. So thank you for that, Dave. That's very useful. Um, some updates. Um, since our last uh, meeting of the panel, we've made a sub submission uh, to part two of the Home Office review into the role of police and crime commissioners, and our supporting officer was invited to contribute to a focus group in the review using some of our experience that we've had um, over the last years. Um, I have been notified that Mark Steele has resigned from New Forest District Council and therefore is no longer a member of the panel. Uh, we expect to receive a replacement appointed by New Forest District Council shortly and thank Mark for his contribution to the panel. Um, as chair of the panel, I would also like to offer my sincere congratulations and support to the City of Southampton for being long listed as a City of Culture for 2025. Let's hope they get shortlisted and are successful in their bid. Uh, I think we would all be very excited and keen to support that across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Uh, I would like also to thank the Commissioner for sharing the role profile for the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner further to the recommendations of our report following the recent confirmation hearing for the role. We look forward to seeing the development of the DPCC's role and the benefits it will bring to our residents. Um, the Commissioner has also provided, uh, and her team, ahead of the public consultation of the draft police and um, crime plan, um, very helpful uh, engagement with members. So we, it helps us to um, look at the um, overall plan, but also specifically a very helpful invitation, which I know lots of members have taken up about visiting the Marine Unit um, at the end of this month. 
the Commissioner has also made uh, us aware within the, that there are some changes within the Estates team over the summer following some issues that were uncovered. The Commissioner has provided uh, me with, on behalf of the panel, an update and confirmation that the issues have been addressed and resolved. The Estates team is now working on business as usual uh, and I think it's appropriate for the Finance Working Group to lead on the Estates as it has in the past as a strand of work and I'm sure the Commissioner will make herself available to the working group as and when required. Um, following uh, our requests before um, elections in our March meeting, I would also uh, further ask, and that the Commissioner has agreed, that the Commission and the working group uh, decide what we need to discuss in our March, uh, <coughs> sorry, our April meeting next year so that we can get into the detail as far as the estate strategy and um, the work that's required going forwards. Um, this will also allow us to have timely discussions around the estates programme in supporting uh, the need needs of the Officer Uplift programme, and I will ask the support officer to add this to the panel's work forward programme. So they're my announcements. I wonder if I could invite the Commissioner to come and make hers. <coughs> Welcome, Commissioner, and, and Jason as the newly appointed Chief Exec, so your first official meeting to the panel. Donna, when you're ready, do take us through your announcements. Thank you very much, Chair. If you can just give me a moment, I'll get my papers together, if that's okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the members of the public that have taken the time to come and make deputations today. It's an important part of our democracy and that people are exercising their right to do so. I'd also like to start by thanking councillors across the whole area, from parishes, districts, the unitaries, the county, everybody, uh, and actually, very importantly, cross-party, independent. I've had contact from every, of, every one of the political parties, well, actually not Green and perhaps not the Reform, whatever they're now called, that, that party, but certainly Lib Dem, Labour and Conservative and Independents um, of all um, uh, political parties across all levels of councils and actually geographically across the whole county who have reached out to me and invited me to go out with them to their areas to go on walk-arounds, perhaps jointly with the police, um, and to consider issues in their wards or that their uh, members of the public in their area are facing. It's incredibly helpful for me to have that, so please, I would be grateful if you can take that back to your councils and encourage, whether it's parishes, town councils, whoever it may be, if they need um, my help and support, if they want to raise something with me, please, please do do that. Moving on, so as uh, you've just uh, stated, Chair, um, it is uh, Jace Kenny's um, second week, third week? Something like that. He came back for week two. That was, that was positive from my perspective. Um, so it is really, really important for me to have a chief executive supporting me uh, with what is an incredibly uh, busy agenda. Um, this week, I had eight meetings on Monday, nine meet uh, eight meetings on Tuesday, nine meetings on Wednesday. Uh, I'm in London for three days next week. I really, really need um, a, a, a very... Um, able chief executive to hold the fort for me and there is so much work that needs to be done behind the scenes which I will take you through throughout the course of today and our subsequent meetings. Um, moving forward, uh, I've had a really useful conversation with the chair and with various members of the panel um, about how you would like things to, to move uh, going forward. And I know you've got a separate item on your agenda today um, around the working groups, so I won't preempt any of that. But what I would like to say is that I think it's eminently sensible that the Chief Finance Officer of my office attends the Finance Working Group because he is my most expert person in all things money, be it constabulary or my own budgets. So um, my offer to you, um, if you would like it, is that the chief, my Chief Executive, Jace, and Andy Lowe, the Chief Finance Officer for the OPCC, attend your finance working group. Um, I did attend the last one, um, and I will come as and when Jace and Andy think I need to be there, uh, and of course, always at your disposal to answer any specific drilling down bits on the various panels. Um, 
Uh, Jace and Nadia, who many of you will know, who's here in the room, and um, for those newer members of the panel, uh, who really manages the relationship between yourselves with Caroline, uh, your chair, and the subcommittee chairs, uh, will attend the plan working group meetings, which I know, Chair, you're also on. Um, you made reference to the estates and the new estates manager, who is a gentleman called Mike Ottaway, started two weeks ago. He's come from CBRE, so he's really getting into some of the sort of exciting and opportunities we have around the estates moving forward. He's getting into that now. In terms of the scrutiny sessions of the uh, police of the chief constable um, from, from my, myself and from my office, um, I wanted to review that and I wanted to give it a bit of a facelift, I wanted to perhaps put a bit more of, of my take on it and to reflect the way that I think the public need and want me to uh, act as their commissioner. Um, the previous way of doing the uh, compass meetings cost around 12 to 15,000 pounds a year just because of the nature of the way it was set up. Uh, what I've introduced now since I last saw you <coughs> in July, and there's a lot that's gone on, it feels like it was, well, not the last time I saw you, but the last time I gave you a commissioner's update, um, an awful lot has happened since then. Um, it has been a very, very busy six months. Uh, so much for the honeymoon period. There has been none. It was straight in feet first. Um, so I've introduced something called COPS, which is the Commissioner's Oversight of Policing Services, and we're delivering that at no extra cost. So we've saved effectively, I, I can't remember if it's 12 or 15,000 pounds, let's go with 12, be um, conservative with a small c, but we're saving um, you know, public money in doing it in a much more interactive, open, transparent way for the public, which means that Olivia and, Olivia and I, whilst we are on um, you know, these interactive Facebook Live uh, events, we are taking questions that are submitted in advance but also those that are coming through uh, on, on the chat. And I've made sure that we, are, that we do not avoid difficult questions, that we are answering all questions to make it fair. Now, of course, not everybody can be available at the time that Olivia and I happen to be sat there for an hour um, answering those questions on a regular basis. So um, that is also saved. It is saved onto the, um, all of both the constabulary and also onto my uh, office social media pages, people to watch at their own leisure. We also upload it onto our YouTube account and we email it out to our whole distribution list, which is you know into the thousands of email addresses now, so that we are trying to get it out there as best we can, whilst also sending that on to councils, um, districts, parishes, you know the whole the whole lot. Um, so moving forward, um, I have, I think I did inform you that I was going to do this. I have now formally taken over the chair of the Hampshire Local Criminal Justice Board. And you will know that with my role, whilst a large part of it is focused on policing services, an increasing amount of my time at the moment is being taken up, particularly around uh, criminal justice. And um, I, I think it's right and proper that I, that I inform you that I have concerns at the moment about the, about the criminal justice system in, in Wessex, but more specifically for here in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, whether that be through court backlogs because of COVID, um, whether it be through practices uh, adopted by some of our criminal justice partners. Um, but certainly a pressing issue that I think it's, again, right and proper for me to inform you of because it's something that's taking up some of my, quite a bit of my time at the moment um, and something that is concerning me is the rights of uh, people who've been um, alleged of crimes to get a fair, quick and expedient hearing. Um, and often that starts with a magistrate's court once they have been charged, obviously, by Hampshire Constabulary. Um, HMCTS, Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service, um, closed Newport custody, which some of you may be aware of, the Remand Court on a Saturday morning, and in Portsmouth uh, five, nearly six weeks ago now. And uh, it was because of staff shortages on the day. So it was all a bit, oh, crikey, balls in the air. And, and then people, uh, Hampshire Constabulary, have scrabbled around for the last five weeks because that has continued. Every Saturday, remand courts in Portsmouth and Newport on the Isle of Wight are, are not sitting due to a lack of legal advisor availability. Now, they're going through an employment situation with their legal advisors. However, I've been notified this morning um, that they are also now closing Basingstoke Roman Court on a Saturday morning from, uh, I think it's the 20-something of, of November. I can confirm the date to you in writing. Now, what that means is, is that anyone who is arrested on a Friday afternoon onwards, as you know, in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, will need to be transported to Southampton, who are going to be, they are now our, our regional 
um, remand court on a Saturday morning. Now, um, it has had a knock-on effect on the constabulary, who have had to transport prisoners um, with the support of Serco, obviously, uh, to Southampton when they weren't expecting to, get people over from the island when they weren't expecting to, which is clearly not easy at short notice. Um, there has been a breach in protocol where prisoners, uh, and I call them prisoners at that point because they were remanded by the courts uh, in Southampton going back two, three and four weeks ago. Um, and Serco said we can no longer transport them onto the prison that they need to go to because the reception desks at the prisons have now closed and they will not admit anyone else in. Yeah. So the constabulary has been left in the unenviable position of having to transport, and they are then prisoners, <coughs> uh, back to police custody, which is in fact against the law. They have no legal right to do that. Um, and the constabulary have therefore referred themselves to the IOPC, not that it's their fault. I mean, they were left holding, holding the baby, so to speak. Um, so they have had to deal with this situation. So I have, as you would expect, as chair of the LCJB, um, uh, written to HMCTS regionally, to the director, to say that this is wholly unacceptable, both for the individuals and also for other partner agencies, particularly with an absolute lack of um, any kind of forewarning of the events happening and also uh, consultation or what the impact may be with partners. So the reason I share that quite specific incident with you, and there are many other things, but the reason I share that one with you is just so that you understand that there are some quite serious things going on. And actually my time, whilst I am very focused on policing services, there is also a huge amount of work that needs to be done with criminal justice partners um, and working very closely with the Crown Prosecution Service as well. Moving on from that one, um, we have had the um, Attorney General, who happens to be a Hampshire MP, but in her formal capacity as Attorney General, did come to the Eastern Pick uh, in Portsmouth um, three or four weeks ago. And again, this was following conversations that the Chief and I had had with her around how we can improve and speed up um, the number of cases we have on RUI, released under investigation, um, and how we can, uh, I can make sure that the victims of crime, the, the you know, members of the public of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight are getting um, a, a better and more expedited criminal justice service. Um, and so we're looking at working on some, some ideas at the moment. And I'm very grateful to the Attorney General for her time and uh, for listening to the ideas that, that I put to her. Moving on, we've had now confirmation um, through the Home Office to all uh, Police and Crime Commissioners and Chief Constables of the uh, Comprehensive Spending Review. So the three-year settlement, which as you will all have heard of in the press, um, is three years across all government departments. However, there is always a however, um, the Home Office, um, and we are waiting on confirmation of this, have decided that they will continue to give the uh, policing precept to commissioners on an annual basis. So whilst I think it's safe for me to make some educated assumptions, um, there are, we are looking at an annual settlement um, as opposed to a three-year, which some other government departments are able to work to a three-year, with the exception of the uplift, which is confirmed, and that money is, is banked, so to speak, um, because uh, of the, of the the commitment that's having to be given by the constabulary to recruiting those people. So, of course, you need that money in perpetuity. Um, now, the downside of annual settlements for me, as, as the commissioner of somebody who is paying for um, some excellent partners out there to deliver some fantastic uh, you know, crime prevention and support services to victims of crime and actually um, those perpetrators of crime who really need help and support to stop perpetrating in the future, um, is that annual awards of grants and contracts often don't bring you the best value or the best outcome. So where I have got some reserves and where I think it would really be detrimental to a particular contract if it was literally done for one year, um, I am now considering looking at two or three year or perhaps doing a, a one year contract but with a option in the contract that I can do a plus one plus one. So I'm not preempting my, my spend, but I'm certainly giving myself some latitude to not have to go through the whole rigmarole of having a public grants round and or going through the procurement exercises. So I'm looking at that at the moment. Um, we do get £388 million a year um, in our total budgets, as you know, and of that, 59% of that comes from the Home Office grant. So you can see how wholly dependent we are on, of course, what we're getting each year. 
So moving on to grants itself, um, so so far this year we've given out uh, 5.4 million pounds, or I should say so far this, this financial year, given out 5.4 million pounds, and that includes a substantial amount of money that has been won, that's the right word, uh, by the commissioning team in my office, for whom I'd like to place on record my sincere thanks for doing an outstanding job. They're bringing in two thirds more than their original base budget in terms of the successful bids they're putting in, whether that be safer streets, whether that be um, 200 grand they received from the Ministry of Justice to have youth navigators in a &E departments to deal with stabbings, because what we know with organised crime is that when people are stabbed, they don't report that to the police. Um, and it's often the A&E doctor and nurse that uncover that someone has got a very nasty six or seven inch stab wound, um, which could have been fatal, or if not, still incredibly serious. Um, and the first the police hear about it is now when A&E are communicating back to the police. And it's really, really important that we are mapping exactly what the level of harm is out there. Because as we know, when you have organized crime gang on organized crime gang, they don't go to the police for help. They deal with it themselves. Ourselves. And we can't put the adequate resource uh, into what we need as councillors and as, as, as people who are elected to represent the public um, if we don't know exactly what is going on out there. So that's key. Um, our violent reduction unit, as you know, almost £800,000, 758k, I think it is, uh, that we have been very, very successful in securing for the last couple of years. And long may that continue. Um, we also managed to, res uh, to secure £78,000 uh, of money to support male victims of rape. Uh, and for me, this is an incredibly important area uh, because I think that that is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the harm and probably what we need to be spending. I think it's probably considerably more than that. Um, but we do know from Manchester last year with the, uh, the individual who was convicted um, of, of, of raping um, another man um, and it was only because he'd been filming all of his other victims that the police uncovered that he was a prolific rapist uh, and probably one of the worst rapists the United Kingdom has ever seen. Um, it, I think it is a bigger issue than we realise and so for me having this money and having some specialist support services looking and considering and feeding back to, to me on what exactly is going on in this area in terms of harm to individuals is key. Uh, my national portfolio, so I've got two national portfolios, as you know. One is the victim's portfolio, and the other one is serious organised crime. Um, are keeping me incredibly busy as well, um, particularly post the, the tragic um, murder of the two ladies um, in, in London. Uh, well, sorry, one, one um, murder, I should say, and the two rapes of ladies in London by by, as they were then, serving Metropolitan Police Officers. Um, the national focus around Vogue, I don't need to <laughs> exercise, that rehearse that to you. You all know what's been going on in the Vogue agenda. But that Vogue um, uh, agenda does sit within the victims' portfolio within the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners. So I've been working closely with government ministers, um, with our new national Vogue lead, who is, as you know, a secondi of Hampshire Constabulary, um, now Deputy uh, Chief Constable Maggie Blythe, who is one of our ACCs here, who's taken on on that new national role, so working very closely with her in her national position as well. Um, it has meant that I've had to do lots of media to be talking about what's going on in terms of the RASO, the, the Rape and Serious Sexual Offences review that the Prime Minister commissioned and the Home Secretary has commissioned some, some subsequent um, reviews from that. What has gone on in terms of and what we now need to do in terms of the new landmark domestic abuse bill that came in in July this year. And we've got the new <coughs> victims bill, victims code um, coming around the corner. Um, I think it's February or March next year. So it's an incredibly busy area to be in, but one that's absolutely key for me to be able to stand up for victims of crime. And to those very brave victims who have come forward to me um, and have uh, shared with me their very personal and very painful uh, stories of where the criminal justice system or other partners have let them down i want to say thank you please keep coming i am working on it and i promise you to give it my absolute uh, attention and commitment to do what i can to help and support and to crucially feedback to the government where changes in the system are required to prevent it happening in the future moving on to uplift so 
when I gave you an update in July, I said that I would, you know, keep, keep the numbers coming through um, as best I can. It's a cl clearly a moving feat. But as of the end of September, which is kind of the, the constabulary are sort of working uh, crudely sort of about a month, a month in arrears with some of these numbers. Um, but the uplift from April of last year, when it really kind of started, when the first recruitees came in in April 2020, to September 2021, we had recruited in Hampshire 621 additional officers of which 385 were the uplift because the remainder were either vacancies carried in things such as investigations which have have ongoing uh, vacancies um, in in the investigation teams but are also people who've left and or retired or you know medically retired perhaps as well so 385 um, was the net <coughs> increase and that does uh, cover a range of, of specialisms within the constabulary um, there are 192 further offices planned to start between now, or I should say probably the 1st of October, um, and March, the end of March uh, next year. So just to give you a flavour of the sort of pace of what's coming through. Um, and the first time the constabulary will actually see a positive benefit of the first new recruits that were recruited in March, April of 2020 will be in March coming, March 2022, because as you know, it takes two years to train them. Um, they have 30% of their time as protected learning time in the classroom because they're doing their police degree. And also there is a, there's an additional detriment to the constabulary in that the supervising of officer, whether that be the PC they're on with on neighborhoods or in response and patrol, or the sergeant, whoever, whoever they're allocated to, has to then spend some of their time supervising, checking off, ticking boxes, doing all the things they need to do to make sure that this person is, is at the adequate stages and level to, to progress and therefore that officer is not working 100% of where they would normally be either so we are going to start seeing the real true operational benefit of having the uplift program from uh, I would say probably the end of March um, after Christmas um, we are also recruiting PCSOs, um, so we uh, there has there has been an uplift. We are we've gone from I think there's been 103 new PCSOs recruited over the same period from March April last year, um, and I think we're currently running at 248 PCSOs roughly, which is about where we well I say not we uh, where the constabulary want to be, um, and they now have in terms of FTEs 3,029. Uh, FTEs so that's where they're at in terms of their officer numbers there are actually more officers because some of them are part-time but it's that's the equivalent FTE moving on then I've got two um, two three or a couple last things chair and then I will wrap up because I'm sure you want to ask questions um, so the VORG working group I think I advised you all in writing and I told you when I've seen spoken to you previously that I was starting and, and setting up um, a county-wide uh, violence against women and girls working group um, to and I call it a working group because I don't want it to be a board where we talk I want it to actually do and that's very very clear in the terms of reference and we did have um, our <coughs> first meeting last week uh, I'm really really pleased with the people that attended we've definitely got the right people around the table the movers and shakers to be able to impact change in their own organizations so her honor uh, judge Angela Morris who is our presiding um, Wessex Circuit judge here based in Winchester we have got the head of probation, the head of or the deputy head of the Crown Prosecution Service came because the head of the Crown Prosecution Service uh, was on leave. But we will have the Suzanne Llewellyn, the head of the Crown Prosecution Service uh, for Wessex, coming as well. We've got prisons. Uh, we've got, as I say, the probation service. I think I mentioned, of course, Hampshire Constabulary. Uh, key is councils um, uh, are also <coughs> represented. CSPs um, and. And importantly, we've got a couple of third sector partners to make sure that we're getting their take on what they're seeing on the ground with victims and with the, the programmes that they're delivering, either on the behalf of probation, us, police, whatever. Um, so we've agreed the terms of reference. Um, there, I've only set it up for a year because I want it to be focused. I don't want this to be something that goes on and on. I want it to be very focused on what it wants to achieve. Um, and I think it was, I've had very positive feedback from that first meeting. Um, there will be a couple of subgroups that will sit underneath that to drill into some of the detail. Next meeting, I think, is in January. Um, and we've all got tasks that we're going away to do between now and January. So we come back uh, and we are also making decisions via email where we need to to expedite things as well to keep them moving. 
Um, I attended, <coughs> um, at the Home Secretary's invitation, the National Policing Board last Wednesday at the Home Office. Um, I was there again um, to discuss VORG um, with my National Victims Portfolio Lead hat on. I uh, was very pleased to attend that um, with the uh, Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Cressida Dick, with uh, Martin Hewitt, who is the Chair of the National Police Chiefs Council, uh, Sir Tom Windsor, who is the uh, Director General of Her Majesty's uh, Constabulary Fire and Rescue Services, I have to think of the new name now, um, and also uh, with um, Lord Nick Herbert, who is the uh, newish chair of the College of Policing. So um, it, it was very good to be able to talk to uh, some of the key leading um, people in, in policing across Hampshire, uh, across the country, um, about what we think needs to happen to improve things around the VORG agenda. Um, and I was there, and I was particularly wanted to talk to them around the sort of the, the prosecution process and how I think that can be expedited. So I will keep you posted if there are more things like that that I, that I am attending. Um, the Home Secretary's Review Part 1 and Part 2, you'll remember I mentioned to you Part 1 happened in March of this year. Part 2 uh, was, I think, a statement made in July or August um, that the Home Secretary has advised me that she's looking to conclude that when I saw her last week um, by December. But certainly um, the requirements that all commissioners must have a deputy by, I think it might be the end of next year, the date to be confirmed. We, they have confirmed now that um, the election of commissioners moving forward from 2024 onwards will be first past the post and not the um, alternative vote as we've had before. Uh, and that has now be laid, has been laid down formally as an amendment to the Police Crime no, it's the Police and Crime Social Responsibility Act um, as a piece of uh, legislation that was laid down last week as, a, as an amendment to that. Um, we, there is also talk about commissioners having accountability over probation, particularly with joint commissioning, which is something, of course, I would very much welcome, having spent 16 years working very closely with probation in my time as a member of the judiciary. ASB task force, so we know the blight of ASB that, has, uh, that affects every single community across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, ASB task force, actually we've been doing a number of things over the summer, I think there's four or five um, examples I could give you if you wish, um, and I won't go in through them now, but if you, if you want me to, I can give you, I can draw down in some more detail on this uh, subsequently, but we have been doing things all over the summer. Uh, we have got the first formal pulling everything together, what have we done over the summer in terms of ASB focus <coughs> between the constabulary and my office, really, really kind of scrutinising what the constabulary are doing, trying to raise this as a much bigger and important focus. Um, we have the first meeting of that, I want to say the 11th of November, I could be wrong, could be the 7th, but anyway, it's coming up certainly uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we'll be very happy to give you feedback on the ASP task force and there are uh, members, CSP chairs and or cabinet members coming along for a couple of the items on that um, uh, in terms of the issues that we have across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, last month, I was also asked to give evidence at the Home Affairs Select Committee um, by the Chair Yvette Cooper and the other committee members on, on that, um, quite an important, actually one of the most important, I think, select committees, I would say that as a Police and Crown Commissioner. But again, it was all around, um, it was about the RASO, the National RASO Review, the, the Prime Minister's focus and the task group that he has monthly, which the Lord Chancellor, the Home Secretary and the Policing Minister and others attend. Um, and they were very much wanting to look at the um, rape prosecution and investigation process um, I have shared on my, um, not through the commissioner, but through my own, my Donna Jones PCC um, Facebook page, if anyone would like to watch the evidence that I gave, I've clipped it so that you don't have to watch all two and a half hours, you can just watch kind of the salient points that I made if you want to, um, but it was very much around uh, the relationship with the Crown Prosecution Service and how I think there are some quick wins to hugely drive up our um, rape prosecution levels here in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And to spend 10 seconds giving you the headlines, we are one of the top forces in the country for our compliance with crime data integrity, the constabulary's requirement to report historic crimes when they become aware of them, even if there will be no investigation. I was punched by my brother 10 years ago, for example, okay? That kind of stuff. We are also one of the top forces, and I'm talking top two or three here, in terms of our compliance with the Director General, the, the Crown Prosecution's Director General's guidance on redaction, DG6, um, which the Attorney General has, of course, uh, given a direction on as it comes under her, the Crown Prosecution Service. And we are one of the top forces nationally for compliance with redacting everything that goes forward to the Crown Prosecution Service before a charge is made. 
However, we are in the bottom four nationally of 43 forces for our rape convictions going forward. So two point, I think we've gone from 2.1 to 2.7 and back down again of, of rape cases being reported are actually going forward to charge, let alone then conviction. I am concerned. I don't think it's good enough. I've made these comments very clearly uh, publicly and including at the Select Committee and I will continue. This is why my role as the Chair of the Hampshire Local Criminal Justice Board is so key because I can perhaps make points that the constabulary may not want to to a fellow partner but for me my role is a convener and it is to, it is to be asking questions that perhaps others may not do. Finally my new grants round. This is my absolute final point Chair I promise you. Um, my new grants round starts at the end of November. Uh, grants up to 35 to 40 thousand pounds given out um, to organisations across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, I think the applications are open for six weeks. Um, and is that right? Yeah. Um, so the chief exec is telling me. Um, and we've we've um, agreed last week what the sort of um, focus around that will be. Particularly, it is around preventing youth crime, preventing first time entrants, FTEs coming into the criminal justice system from reoffending again. Looking at how we can use out of court disposals. It's around ASB. And the theme that is running through everything that I'm doing right now is about trauma informed work. How we can can help these these kids that are growing up in in homes where perhaps mum has got alcohol dependency perhaps severe mental health issues perhaps violent father parents are divorced perhaps a sexual abuse whatever it may be these types of traumas when you add them all up together maybe we can cope with one or two of these when you have six seven eight nine ten of these type of traumas in your life as you're growing up your propensity to get involved in crime or to be a victim of serious crime by even your middle teens is is off the scale compared to somebody who ha a classmate sat next to you who hasn't had the same level of trauma in their in their younger years and in their childhood. So for me, it's about how we are supporting parents uh, to to try and make sure that they are protecting their children as they're growing up to not have those experiences, so we can prevent the criminals of the future being being raised in this country. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we will, of course, have some questions. Just to sort of give it a bit of context, what I've asked panel members to do is actually um, with the police and crime panel, police and crime plan agenda item next. If there's something that's covered in that, to cover it at the same time, so we don't cover it twice. Just so that you know that to save us a bit of time. If there's a theme that you've covered in both items. Um, I'm sure some members will have um, questions that they think aren't in that agenda item, and I've already got a couple of people. Um, one thing that I'd just like a bit of clarification on, and hopefully they're very um, closed questions, that you'll be able to share with us the response that you get um, from your letter regarding remand courts with the panel when you get a response as far as updating us with what's happening. And the other item is um, just one of the things that we've spent some time over the past few years with the office talking about is the um, table as far as officers and you've given us a verbal update as far as officers recruitment and establishment just when you might be able to share that with the panel in a, 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 t a table form so that I, I don't expect anybody to have been able to write it down that quickly whether you might be able to um, give us a date when you'll be able to share that and if perhaps you want to ask answer those two and then I'll move on to the questions that I've got Absolutely. Um, in terms of Wendy Waterman, I've written to both her and the regional director of HMCTS. Wendy acknowledged my letter yesterday to say that she will come back to me ASAP. Um, depending on the content of the letter and what's in it, um, I will look to share that with you. As long as there is nothing in there that shouldn't be shared publicly, then I will do that. And if there is, I'll ask her if I can share it perhaps with you on a confidential basis, but I don't envisage there would be. Um, and secondly, um, table update and uplift numbers. Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So uh, the people that I've got to ask questions, I've got Dave Stewart and then Councillor Craig. So Dave, if you could ask yours first. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> following the annual conference, which I attended and gave an update earlier, can I invite yourself to review the Police and Crime Panel report from the Police Foundation um, <coughs> for your information? Um, I know it will be available. Um, and there was certainly a Police and Crime Commissioner there who was sponsoring it. So um, that was the first, probably a yes, no answer. And then could you give any update on information you may have on the potential integration of responsibilities linked to the fire service 
and the prison service, and you've already mentioned the probation service. So I just don't know if there's any update on that progress. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. In terms of the Police Foundation report to the Police and Crime Panel's annual conference, I don't know if I've had that, if I haven't, if perhaps, Caroline, you could have sending that to us. And Dave, were you asking for me to then read it and give you a response on it? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, it's more for your information, oh, okay. because I think you should be cited on some of the information we yeah. had, because it will affect things, and I think yeah. it's, I'm just almost informing you about it. Very useful. Thank you very much. I will look over that. Thank you. Kind of you. Um, in terms of the um, white paper, so you'll remember Lord Stephen Greenhall, who is in the DCLG, um, has written a white paper around fire services coming under commissioners where there is a coterminous boundary. Um, I think it's fair to say it's hit some political stumbling blocks um, and the white paper was due to have been out in the autumn. And here we are um, approaching Christmas. It's not out. So I'm not holding my breath. Let's wait and see. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at, really. I've had some very healthy conversations with the Police Authority Board and I have taken a seat up on the Police Authority Board, but very much as a, as a non-voting partner. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Councillor Craig. Thank you, Chair. I think that is on. Um, it was just a question over the um, remand courts. Yes. Uh, you were saying that the, they go to Southampton and then Southampton um, have to keep them in custody. Is that actually in Southampton they keep them in custody or do they go elsewhere and then I'll follow that up? Well, Serco and or Hampshire Constabulary, but Serco are the people that contracted to do it, would then look to bring custody, sorry, um, detainees, as they're called at that point, from Newport, Basingstoke, Portsmouth to Southampton and normally get them there by about 9.30 in the morning. Now, our problem is, is that there are 36 cells at Southampton um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't, if you've got a busy Christmas period, World Cup, Euro European, whatever, it doesn't take a lot before the cells are really, really busy. So it might be, that the police are going to have to stagger it so that they work with Serco. So if all the cells are full up in Southampton with their existing business of people that they might release without charge, it's not everyone that's going to court this in cells. Some of them are other cases that are being processed not to go to magistrates just yet. Um, so they would then have to stagger what time people arrive, for example, from Basingstoke and Portsmouth. The island people are going to have to get on that ferry, get over and be there. But, um, yeah, so they're going to have to stagger it. So there is a problem around the flow and capacity at Southampton Police Station at the Western Pick. Um, but once they are then transported to the courts um, at half nine in the morning, quarter past half past nine by Serco, um, they would then to Southampton Magistrates Courts. From that point onwards, legally, they are not down to the constabulary anymore. It's, they are then the prison service and Serco who are contracted to get them to the prison. So that really should be, the constabulary should drop them off at the door and say, off you go. Um, and that should be it. That's not what's happened over the last few weeks. It is an issue. Um, and I, you know, there are things the constabulary do that, that, that aren't right. Um, but on this one, I have their back because it's not their fault. And they really have been quite dropped in it. And, you know, to save five or six thousand pound a year through HMC CTS by cutting a legal advisor's overtime from 200 quid to 100 quid on a Saturday, they cost Hampshire constabulary nine grand in one weekend by what the transporting, the additional keeping them in custody until the Monday. It was wholly, wholly unacceptable. So going back to my question then, are they kept in Southampton or are they... No, so as long as they get there for the court, um, they then get transported onto the prison. So they, if, if, for example, uh, you're in custody, uh, um, sorry, in Southampton Magistrates Courts on a Saturday morning and the magistrate said you are remanded in custody, you then go off to whichever prison you're going to, so Winchester or wherever. Um, so, no, they're not kept in Southampton over the weekend. They, they, they have been kept in police custody over the weekend when they were technically prisoners at that point because they were then Serco and the prison's problem problem because the prison said our desks are closed. Saturdays are slightly different in that prisons accept people for longer because if you get to a magistrate's court on a Saturday morning and there are three in custody coming through, you'll be done by 11 o'clock, quarter past 11 perhaps. If there are 20 in custody, the magistrates and the legal advisor and the Crown Prosecution Service and defence solicitors can still be sitting until two or three in the afternoon and Serco are contracted to stay until, you know, they've got everyone to take them off to prison. Or if they've got too many detainees, they will take a prison and bus and then bring another bus to take you know if they can't get them all on one bus and of course they go to different locations as well if you've got female prisoners they're going to different places to male prisoners so no they will not be they should absolutely not be staying in Southampton over the weekend okay I think that that sort of 
answers it because it's we we have problems with our police force having to um, take people that are being taken to custody. Southampton's full; they then have to go to the New Forest or even further afield, and it takes officers away from us needing them in the area. Um, an example, at the weekend, we had uh, two young females set fire to um, play equipment in one of our parks, which then caused problems around trees and things. Um, a member of the public phoned and said, you know, these girls are in the area. We have no officers around because they're out taking people to further away. And I think it's just absolutely ludicrous that we're already short-staffed with the police force, um, and then you've got them doing things like that know that takes them away travel because you need two officers to transport them so you're taking two officers further and further away every time this happens um, so you know our crimes aren't being dealt with um, one further question could you just update on, on the end of, of your um, announcements you said about rape figures um, and how they weren't being prosecuted um, we were quite low on that does that include historical cases as well yes it does and I completely agree with the points you're making about the strain on the police force, exactly why I'm making, uh, you know, quite a focus of this. Um, and it does have a knock-on effect to investigators, investigate CID, um, as, as well as the response patrol and neighbourhoods as well. So it's across the whole force you have that knock-on effect with having to travel further, which takes more time. Um, with regards to the rape numbers, um, yes, it is historical where they can be. So, of course, the first thing the police have to do when a, um, a, an allegation is made, whether it be historical or current, is to decide whether or not there is enough potential evidence to be able to move into that full investigation. So you might have somebody who will, a domestic violence victim, for example, who might come forward and say, I've got a broken nose and a broken jaw and I'm living in a very controlling, abusive, violent, seriously violent home with my husband who also raped me yesterday um, and he's also been raping me for the last 10 years. So they've then got to work out what uh, focus they put on that one. But th that's the where your crime data integrity comes in in terms of recording stuff. But actually um, it's the number of the crime numbers we had, rape numbers we had in 2015-16, which is the kind of benchmark the government are trying to get back to. It, it wasn't great in 2015 or 16 either, by the way, you know, nationally. But here in Hampshire, we were getting between five and 600 rape cases a year reported back then. Since CDI's come in in 2016-17, um, and you've now got the redaction issue, which is slowing down investigations hugely, um, because it's the investigators that have to redact all of even body worn, blur out somebody's face if they're not relevant, everything before it can go to the Crown Prosecution Service because the constabulary own the data. So from a data protection perspective, GDPR, it's about what's passed on. Um, we now have around 2,800 reports of rape a year, um, and in 2015-16, we were having, I think 2015, we had 120 cases of rape that went forward for charge to trial and or sentencing, and then in 2016, it went down slightly to 116 cases, and then last year, we were down to 56, but 2,800 reports of rape. So you can see how one has shot up, one has come down, um, and we've gone from having 8 9% of our cases going forward to uh, rape charge to, as I say, under 3%, to 2.5%, probably the average. Um, it's really not good enough. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I thank members for uh, holding on to their questions for the next item. So perhaps if we can move on to agenda item number seven, which is to uh, go through the draft police crime plan. Um, which is pages 9 to 38 in our papers. Uh, I can see that the AV uh, people are sorting you out, Donna, with your, your clicker. Uh, so in your own time, when you're ready to take us through it. Chair, with your permission, um, I'll introduce this if I may. Yeah, of course, Jason. Um, Chair, members of the panel, um, thank you. Um, I've provided a, a brief covering report um, to support the Commissioner's presentation of the draft uh, More Police, Safer Streets, Police and Crime Plan. Uh, which covers the period of 2021 to 2024. Um, the plan has been prepared in line with the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act of 2011, and it sets out the Commissioner's strategic intent and strategic direction for crime and policing for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. The report provides a high-level narrative, uh, including a summary of the consultation process, which the Commissioner will also update on um, shortly. Prior to handing over to the Commissioner to present the draft plan to you, my report provides a single recommendation to the panel, if I may. 
to review the draft police and crime plan and to make such a report and recommendations uh, uh, upon which the panel considers to be appropriate. Thank you. Commissioner. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, uh, Andy, do, do I need to click first or are we? Okay, here we go. So whilst the um, computer's warming up, um, here is the front page of the new police and crime plan. Um, here we go. Right, so um, this um, is what it looks like on the front page. So we sent you the draft, as you know, going back in, I think it was 20th of August, and the chair had had it um, the week before that as well. We've done some um, changes. We have uh, gone through with the, uh, following our extensive consultation, how to make it better, how to make it more user-friendly. So I'm going to take you through some of the um, information with regards to what we've done with the police and crime plan subsequently. But um, if we can just go back a moment, because um, you're going to all start reading those numbers for a minute, so I'm just going to go back, um, to just give you a qu quick overview. So first of all, um, re following some really, really, really useful feedback, particularly from Councillor Cartwright, who was very helpful in terms of the conversations we had and the team's call that we had, where you kind of explained where you th how you think the plan has gone over a number of years, um, good or bad, um, and, you know, coming into this role new and, you know, having represented the public for a number of years, um, you know if you're in crisis and you've got an issue, you don't want to have to spend two hours reading a really big document. So I hope what this now gives you is clear, precise, measurable outcomes that you can go to depending on from the index, what's my issue, it's knife crime, I want to look at what's being done. So, a new approach, shorter, Less than 40 pages. I wanted it to be around 30 even, but perhaps I might get there next time. Um, but certainly around 40 pages. Larger text, precise, clear outcomes and aims so that you can hold me to account and the public can hold me to account and I can use that as my tool to hold the constabulary to account. That is obviously the purpose of this document, to really improve things for uh, the people of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, the 2 million people. Um, I think it's the most accessible plan uh, that, that, that we've had. It's, I think it's certainly one of the most accessi accessible plans nationally, and I've looked at other commissioners as well. And this will, of course, be a living document. This is not set in a tablet of stone now. This will be something that will evolve and grow um, as the needs change over the next uh, few years. Um, it obviously sets out my uh, police and crime plan objectives up to 2024, which is the requirement in law of what I have to do, um, and also how I will deliver them. It also very clearly, as I says, tells the public what they can expect from me and how they can clearly identify issues and outcomes in the document. It does also give um, a summary at the back around holding the Chief Constable to account around the delivery of the policing priorities that I have set on behalf of the public following extensive consultation. It also talks about how I will support victims. It includes the things that I have to include legally, um, which are a reflection of national strategic policing priorities. Um, it covers the violence against women and girls agenda, which again has now become a requirement direction from the Home Secretary, and also knife crime. It talks about the high harm, the forces highest harm crimes, which I actually think Hampshire Constabulary have got right. Um, it sets the policing priorities and uh, reflects the public's needs and feedback that they gave to me. And I'm now going to turn, um, going through some of the consultation points to these slides, because of course, it's not about what I think and I want, it's about what I need to do to represent what other people um, are asking me to do as their representative. So first of all, um, how, uh, so you can still hear me on the microphone, you can see on here that we had, uh, we, we, I did my own consultation through August to September 2020, where I had nearly 2,000 people that responded to my online survey, which is what led to me creating my manifesto for election. That was the pledges I was elected on. So as you would expect, they have of course formed the foundation and bedrock of my police and crime plan. Now, the, we then consulted as the Office of Police and Crime Commissioner from August of this year until October. We had an eight-week consultation, which um, meant that we had 7,336 responses, which is the highest that we've ever had uh, through the OPCC office, of which 4,641 were responses to online surveys. 
Um, it, as I say, incredibly successful. We had eight focused working groups, including with uh, BAME community representatives, elderly people, disabled groups, um, uh, very much uh, a feedback from pensioners. And we used YouGov to help us to make sure that we were getting responses from all 14 district um, council areas across the county, and in particular, making sure that our responses were coming from um, all parts of the community so that they are not just uh, coming from people who are the most likely to look at social media, for example, or respond to a letter that's been sent to them or an email. Um, so we did um, also use paid advertising um, to get this across um, online, and we had we reached 900, and I think it was 60 or 70 thousand people. It was nearly a million reaches that we had through social media, which is again um, the best that we've ever had. It was outstanding. Um, so cantering through this, um, you can see uh, the survey open for eight weeks. And the pie chart here shows you the district council uh, area, so the people that responded where they live effectively. Um, and you can see that there is a split. Um, some of the bigger council areas, of course, representing a bigger number. So Basingstoke and Dean, one of our biggest urban areas, you can see um, is, a, is a bigger slice of the pie there, as you would expect, because there are more people. Um, and moving on uh, from the uh, consultation uh, spread, um, in terms of the reach and engagement, we had press releases, uh, we, so we had some good coverage in the media, so thank you to the media for covering that, it's very important. Uh, we used the Hampshire and Isle of Wight alert scheme, which I'm sure many of you will be signed up to. Uh, we did use our social media, Rural Times, the PCC monthly newsletter, which gets emailed out to people that are on uh, the database um, through my office, and also stakeholder letters, so we, we emailed the link to people as well. Um, you can see here as well in terms of partners we worked with, it was sent to district council, to all councils, CSPs, it was sent to fire, health, we really made sure that we reached out and in fact included, uh, invited CSPs to the focus groups as well. Um, Councillors, council leaders, um, then you can see here the response to the main priorities and actually all of the nine top main priority areas where I think... Uh, responded to and supported incredibly strongly. Probably one of the ones that was lower than I would have expected was the 67.67% for more customer-focused police call handling. Um, and I think that's because of the wording of that, <laughs> if I'm honest with you. Um, so feedback, looking at that, deciphering, because we all know that people are frustrated with 101, right? We don't need a survey to tell us that. They tell us that all the time. So I was very surprised by that. And I think it's because of the wording of the question in the, con in the survey. And that was what the problem was. So what we've actually now done in the final version that we've got for you today in this draft is we've reworded what that means so that it makes it much clearer what we're trying to achieve. Um, then uh, listening and reviewing. So after the consultation finished, we spent a whole two weeks, or the, the performance team and the comms team spent a whole two weeks deciphering all of the information. Um, we've simplified the content. Uh, we've added greater clarity. Um, when we shared it with you back in August, one of you said very, um, was really good, some good feedback, an example. It's not illegal encampments, it's unauthorised encampments, again, key things like that could have got me in hot water, so thank you very much for helping me with that. So we've, we've made sure that we've really, you know, kind of gone through all of the feedback, line by line by line, to make sure that we are adapting and, and making it as, as representative as people want it to be. Um, we've then changed some of the pictures, so here, um, the, when we say here, I should caveat, the plan will be launched on the 16th of November, it should say subject to your support today, because of course, if following today there are things that you come back with, again, we will be giving those consideration and working out how we can address those, um, those areas. So I think really um, the main takeaway for me is the focus on, um, on the diversity to make sure that it was doing everything that we needed to do in terms of our consultation and my mandatory requirements to do that. Um, we've used YouGov to make sure that we are fair, representative and covering the demographics. Um, and, and really, Chair, I hope that from your feedback and from the, the work that, that some of you have kindly given to me on the preparation of this document, it's something that you will find helpful as an aid memoir to hold me to account moving forward because I've tried to make sure that it is a proper document and not just a tick box that it's something that I have to have. Um, 
So what I'm going to do now, finally, Chair, if that's okay, the last two parts, is I'm going to um, just, if we can, Andy, please, get the, um, the PDF version. So there are two parts to the Police and Crime um, Plan. So first of all, um, we have got a microsite which is called More Police Safer Streets. It's not up yet because, of course, we're waiting for your feedback. If I get endorsement from the panel today or, or whenever that comes subsequently, that will go live. And that means that you can go to www.morepolicesaferstreets.com uh, and that will take you straight into the front page and then you can scroll through uh, and we can show and you know that's something that is is um, that we can do thank you um, we also have the PDF version um, so that we can send that to us. So say, for example, you wanted to print this out. I mean, we are going to print lots of these once we've got your support. They obviously haven't gone to print yet. Probably won't go to print for a couple of weeks to make sure that we've got feedback and chance to do what we need to do. But once we're in a position, this will go to print and then we'll send it out to, of course, councillors and all of our key partners across, across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. But we will also want, so maybe that someone wants to have a click, PDF, click to the PDF version, they can print it out themselves, share it, whatever. So there is the microsite version, which has videos embedded in it, because I wanted to make it very interactive for people who are dyslexic, who maybe can't read even, even this level of text would be a challenge for them. Um, so we've got videos embedded in the microsite version. So if you are somebody who has learning difficulties, if you're dyslexic, if you are blind, you can listen to it. If you are deaf, you can read the subtitles titles to make it as as user friendly as we possibly can because some of the most vulnerable people in our communities would perhaps struggle with the levels of English that, that we all have the privilege to have been to have been taught in our lives and therefore making it really accessible was really key for me so um, the microsite does that in the PDF version of course you don't have the video because it's, it's a one-dimensional but you have then images which re will replace so this is it um, I'm going to click through to show you. This is the PDF version, not the microsite version. So um, you can see the intro from me and then the part from Olivia. And I've got Olivia's video, which is embedded in the microsite, which I'll play to you in a moment, so you can see the kind of feel of it as well. Um, and then really we get on to, there's the priorities, uh, the top nine priorities listed there. And then we move on to... This is the layout for the page. Of course, it's got draft on at the moment because it's subject to your support. So on each page, you will have the pledge. What am I trying to achieve from what the public have told me they want? This is why we need to do it. This is how we'll do it. And this is the takeaway that you should be able to judge me on if you're a member of the public or you as the panel moving forward. So every page follows the same format so that it is easy to digest by page two or three. You should start to think, oh, okay, I know where I'm going now for each of these, each of these takeaways, depending on what you're looking for. So the visibility, um, so of course you can see, now I'm just going to canter through slightly quicker. Um, so you can see here, making it easier to report through 101, that's where we've changed the wording to make it clearer what we actually mean. Um, and I'm sure that that would have got nearly 100% if it had said that a bit clearer <laughs> for the survey. Um, young people getting involved in crime, something I feel very strongly about. Um, obviously the knife crime stuff. And then we get through the main priorities and then you, we come on to the uh, summary of my success will be measured when you know, the, these things happen. So, for example, you feel safer in your community. You feel like you're being listened to by the police and you get feedback when you report a crime. We're not asking for the world here. We're asking for some basics, but this is what the public quite rightly deserve for the money that they spend on our police service. We then move on to other crimes. So these are not necessarily the ones the public have told me that they are massively concerned about. They're very concerned about ASB. They're very concerned about, you know, electric scooters and, and traffic and noisy motorbikes. However, these are the things that can really, really cause problems and have a significant impact on people's lives and livelihoods. So these are the things that the um, uh, other issues, perhaps, that weren't quite so obvious when we were doing the survey... Um, and then we're on to the crimes that hurt you the most. The bit that actually I think the constabulary have got pretty, doing pretty well. Um, homicide, our homicide rates are actually really good in Hampshire. We're very good at detecting homicides. One of the best in the country on that one. Um, domestic abuse, of course, and rape. Um, and then the child exploitation, fraud and cybercrime, retail crime. And again, a summary of how the successes can be measured. Then we're on to my other new favourite subject, the criminal justice system, because of course it's a big part of my role. As I said at the beginning, it's not all about policing. So then on to the criminal justice system, what I will do, what I'm looking, how you can again uh, measure the success. Um, a bit about budgets, grants and accountability, you'll know from the report that's a requirement that I have to have in my plan. 
And then we have the end. And now, Andy, I don't know how we can go on to Olivia's video, if we can, please. So we've got Ben Snugs, Olivia, myself, victim. We've got a whole plethora of different videos. There we go. Thank you very much. Are you doing it or am I? Oh, no, there we go. I think I'm nearly there. The plan set out by the Police and Crime Commissioner is really welcome and the fact that it's been subject to such consultation is brilliant for us in the constabulary and helps us build on the engagement and what we already know our priorities and are needed operationally uh, within our area. We've got so many new police officers coming, that's really welcome. It means that we can both be more accessible and visible but also able to deal with more of the crimes that matter to people. And as those new officers conclude their training and come out and about in all our communities, they really will be felt. And what that means is we're able to do what we already do, which is deal with the most serious things and prevent the most serious things that happen in our community, but also are able to deal with the crimes that we want to, that we know matter to all our public too. So what that means in practice is that more officers will be able to address the matters that are in uh, the police and crime plan, but also help us bring more offenders to justice, which is what we all want to achieve. Chair, that's the end of my presentation on the police and crime plan. Thank you very much, Commissioner and, and Chief Executive. Um, it will be no surprise to you that we have a long list of questions which we'll start working through, if, if we may. Um, so first of all, I'm going to start with Councillor Cartwright. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Donna. Morning. Um, I, I was, uh, Intrigued to hear your comment to start with about the uh, the police and crime plan and our conversation. Um, I think you know, as a long-serving member of this panel, um, this is the third pa uh, plan that I've now seen actually. And I've got to say personally, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's very readable. It mm -hmm. it works well. It's got all the various p points in it. So I think you know that's personally an, an excellent plan now, in comp certainly in comparison to the last one. I'll make no further comment on that. Um, I think my question really was, was what was learnt or been adapted as a result of the public consultation on the draft plan? I think you probably covered a lot of that anyway, but perhaps you could just tell me what the main sort of themes were that sort of people really, you know, said to you to make you change or, you know, modify the plan, basically. Well, some legalities, like I say, illegal to unauthorised, <laughs> certainly that was a very key one. Thank you to the panel again. Um, I think just making it clearer, you know, when you live in this world, you know what it's like, it's us in local government, it's all the same. When you eat, sleep and breathe something, when we're talking about RUIs, we're talking about RASO, we can think, you know, uh, it's very easy to assume that people know exactly what you mean. And when you remember the public, you think, well, what, what's RASO? Well, to me, RASO is rape and serious sexual offences. Actually, even to a lot of our councillors, they wouldn't really know that. So making sure that we've just challenged every single thing. Um, the feedback from the public was great. Um, we had some feedback from, um, really interesting, from pensioner groups and also from... Um, BAME communities that we, we I think were two particular um, sessions through the, the public session, the, the consultation sessions, the focus groups, we had some really good feedback. So it was around wording, the 101, making sure that things are clearer. And there's a couple of other points we literally tweaked in the last couple of days and Keely is sat over here and she will remind me. Um, there was a couple of extra things. Can you think of anything particularly? We had feedback on pictures, that's right, actually. The connotation that some of the pictures created about, like, young people or whatever. So we adapted some of those so that, yeah, the images were actually really important as well, weren't they? So that was, they were probably the main ones. Um, and then I sense-checked it with my mum and my brother because my mum is really non-political and has not, no interest at all um, in a lot of things. Uh, um, and my brother has quite severe learning disabilities. So have a look. Tell me what you think. And he went, it's not a very nice picture of you, is it? And I said, well, thanks very much for that. Um, but, but beyond that, actually getting his sense check on it was was really quite key as well really so um yeah brilliant thank you very much uh, donna if i can go to councillor b this now uh, commissioner can i too um congratulate you on the clarity of the plan um i think it's brilliant the way it's all laid out and how easy it is to read and go through it um uh, I, I also congratulate you on the, the uh, public consultation numbers. I've not seen a consultation that's got as many as that, so, so thank you for that. Um, you mentioned in your announcements uh, about the victims of crime. 
uh, <coughs> which of course are, are very important. Now, how did you ensure that the victims of crime were uh, sought and as part of this consultation of the plan? And, and, and how did you um, develop that into the plan? Thank you very much. Um, by working with the Victim Care Service, who we spend over £600,000 a year with each year. So we, it was sent to them, and then they very delicately discussed it with victims at the right time. So covering a range of different types of victims as well, from violence, from knife crime, from exploitation, uh, from online fraud victims, um, who are so often... Uh, not given perhaps the attention and focus that they need when you think about the harm to somebody losing their entire life savings, worrying about putting on their heating. Yeah, it's really bad if someone smashes your car up or steals it. It can be replaced if it's insured. If someone steals your entire life savings, you can feel pretty, pretty uh, empty as a result of that. So actually, it was a whole load of people, but we did use professional services to help us do that because, of course, me or someone in the team going directly to victims would be probably... Um, maybe a bit too raw for, for them maybe to, to do that. But we also do have a number of victims who have chosen to be on our email distribution system. So of course they are also, because very often the caseworkers you can imagine I get are from victims of crime who are not happy with the outcome of the either the police investigation, which is more often than not what it is, I'd say 70 to 80% of my cases, or the outcome of the criminal uh, justice system at the other end, but majority is, is complaints about the police as you would expect. Um, so yes, we have done that, um, and it has been done very sensitively, um, as, as quite rightly it should be, I think. Um, thank you very much for your, for your positive comments as well. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. If I can hand over to Shirley for the next question. Yes, Lauren, more congratulations. I've been involved with a couple of these before in the north and the middle of the country, and this is by far the best presentation I have ever seen. However, I share your desire to prune it dramatically. I rather like eight pages rather than There's 30. a challenge, Shirley. <laughs> and my question is twofold, please. Um, first of all, although we've seen the um, introduction from Olivia, what I'd like to know is if you've sought the assurances from the Chief Constable that her operational priorities along with the commitments made with the plan and you've had her assurances of those. And secondly, I'd just like to know, to add a supplement to that, to say what sort of consultation have you done with the CPs more di CSPs more directly and what has their influence been on the plan? Thank you very much, uh, Shirley. Some really good points. Um, in terms of the consultation numbers, you're right, they are extraordinary. And I would like to place on record my sincere thanks to um, the OPCC team, comms team, who have worked incredibly hard, supported by other members of the team as well, to get those numbers to just exactly where they are, which are extraordinary. And I would hazard a guess at probably one of the highest in the country. So well done to, to all of them. Um, I, I genuinely can take no credit for how much outreach we've had because it has absolutely been down to them. Um, in terms of the constabulary and Olivia, well, I'm going to pass over to, to Jason in a minute, if I may. <clears throat> but yes, the constabulary had it um, early on. They were working on this. This work started, I was elected, I took the oath of office on Thursday the 13th of May um, at about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I think we started work on it two weeks later. Um, and actually what the comms team, Keeley particularly, who sat here today, who deserves a credit for this, had done throughout the entire election campaign for all candidates that were standing was track every single thing that we were saying on social media every single day and keep a log of any pledges, any comments. And I did a lot of social media <laughs> because, of course, we were in COVID and I couldn't go out and campaign as I normally would do. So by the time I got elected, we were able to start work very, very quickly because they had created almost a crib sheet of what Donna Jones had said and what so, you know, each person said. So they were you know, able to sit down with me and say, look, this is what you said. Everything you said during the election campaign on Facebook Lives, on your posts, on your Twitter, on whatever it may be, um, let's look at what of that you want to form into your plan. So we got started working very quickly um, and the constabulary were involved from the very first meeting through Jace who I'll now pass over to Jace, who can explain what his role was and, and what he did to feed in on behalf of the constabulary. Thank you. So um, some of you, if not all of you, will be aware that my previous role was as the senior police liaison officer um, between the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner and um, Hampshire Constabulary. Um, so I was uh, essentially completing that job between uh, January and August uh, 2021 until I retired. Um, so uh, a key component of my role was essentially to um, support um, the um, OPCC in terms of the development and shaping of the uh, police, uh, PCC's priorities and the plan 
whilst also uh, what was running alongside that was a review um, of the Chief Constable's operational strategy. So my role essentially was to support the uh, PCC, but also to work alongside the Chief Constable and her team to make sure actually one was cognizant of the other so that actually operational delivery would reflect ultimately the strategic direction being set out by the Commissioner. And so making sure that the constabulary were comfortable and happy when we got to the end, you know, towards the end of the process of the, of the kind of say the first draft, it wasn't the first draft, it was about the 20th iteration, but by, I went on holiday on the 18th of August, so what we knew was by the beginning of August, we really, really wanted to have it worded and phraseology and sort of have all of that unified together. So the team, the senior leadership team at OPCC took sections each so jace for example worked very closely with anya who's our head of performance and they were drilling down on how crime areas could be considered what we needed to do what how that would fit into the constabulary we then sent it to the constabulary um end of july beginning of august they then came back with their bits and pieces we then sent it to councillor bound 13th of august to the wider panel on the 20th and then Get, and then took that feedback from constabulary and panel and wider CSPs who also had it. So working with all of our key partners, including the ICS. Um, so the health partners were obviously very, very key for some of these things and understanding, particularly around the knife crime and the things that they're picking up at the other end uh, and drugs. Um, so feedback we had from them. And then, uh, yes, yeah, so the CSPs were, were sent the very early draft, the medium draft, the more this more final draft. They were invited to all of our focus groups um, and they also had one-to-one, -one, uh, CSP managers had one-to-one -one conversations with our comms team and or through our commissioning teams around the various areas as well. Great, thank you very much. Trevor, did you have a supplementary? Yes, I think I do actually. Um, Donna, as um, chairman of Ferrum's Community Safety Partnership, obviously, um, in the past, we've sort of seen how the communication works between your office and the CSPs, and what probably more importantly is how you know the um, their local delivery plans are aligned to the police and crime plan objectives. And I think it's important, but I'd be more interested, I think, as such, in the way forward with CSPs. Yeah, that's a really, really important point. And I think that's something that we're now about to move into that phase now of exactly how we do that um, through the working group you have here. And then obviously with, um, you know, with, with Councillor Baines in her, with her other hat on, in her day job hat on, in terms of being um, a coordinator and a rep um, as well for all of the CSPs across the whole of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, also, the Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner, um, it has actually had some traction with some of the CSPs, but is struggling to get into some of the others, but really, really, really wants to be attending all of the CSP meetings. So again, he can be giving you verbal updates. And if you say, look, priority number six is around blah, please can you um, come back to the next meeting, councillor? Well, actually, he won't be then, He's, but Luke Stubbs, can you tell us what you're doing around this particular area? So either it can be picked up through your um, the plan working group through this um, you know, through the police and crime panel or through your CSPs, whatever. So we're happy to share that information with you. Great, thank you very much. If I can move on to Councillor Vaughan. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you, Chair. Um, hello, Commissioner. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, I really like um, the plan. It's amazing. Um, it's easy to read. Um, I'm dyslexic. Um, I found it easy to read. Um, I did go back over some points um, because I think the more you go through it, the easier it is to pick up. Um, highlighting it, um, specific words so that you can see them. So I think it is very good. Self-explanatory, perfect. Um, and the consultation, I just think hands, hats off to you. So I just think it's perfect. Thank um, you. So congratulations. Um, with regards to um, the 600 more police officers that's mentioned within the plan, I just wanted to ask some questions on that really. is um, By the end of um, 2023, um, the plan outlines 600 more police officers um, as a priority. I know we've um, clarified today about um, 103 PSOs uplift um, and 385, and I just wondered if um, we could just go down um, for clarity is how is it going to be measured or how is it being measured um, and um, whether it's with regards to attrition 
um, and whether it's just going to be replacement is people leaves really and if you could break this down into clearer figures for me please thank Ab you absolutely um, and that's I think probably the biggest challenge for the constabulary is it's not just about the recruitment of 600 extra officers over a two-year period it's also about the attrition as you've mentioned those that are leaving retiring medically or otherwise um, and that also goes for the PCSOs now actually the PCSO churn has been lower than than normally would have happened if you look at averages over the last couple of years the natural level that the constabulary would like to be at for PCSOs is I think nearer 210 220 and we're currently up at 280 odd um, uh, and that's because the attrition has been slower and and I suspect that's because of the pandemic, because people that might otherwise have thought, oh, I fancy a new challenge now are thinking, hmm, I might stay working for a government organisation because my job might be more secure. Um, actually, I would love us to have um, uh, the ability, whilst we're talking about PCSOs, to help financially incentivise them to become police officers, because... If you um, are a PCSO that's at the top of your pay grade, you're up to 29, 29 and a half grand, and you start as a, as a police officer on 23 and a half, 24,000. I think it's 24. So actually, if you've got you know, a mortgage, kids, that's quite a big drop in salary um, to to have a commitment, you know, if you've been already working in Hampshire Constabulary for a number of years and you really enjoy what you do, but would like to have a warrant card and be able to have further career progression. So the Chief Constable and I have spoken to her about this to say, what can we do? Because I've met two or three really good PCSOs out and about on my travels, one of which is in Winchester. He's an excellent PCSO that people really, really like him. Um, but he's at the top of his pay band and he said, I just can't afford to take the pay cut. So there has to be a fairer way that we can help people. So we're looking at that at the moment, or she's looking at that to come back to me on that um yeah it's a challenge to keep the recruitment i mean 600 for me again tip of the iceberg i think we probably need three times that so you know we need to carry on recruiting i need to carry on challenging finding savings whether it's in within my own spend whether it's within the constabularies challenging things they want to spend money on looking at all different back office support services any organizations outside partners we use is that is that best value to really make sure that every penny that we have of public money where we can is spent on increasing the number of police officers that we have um, or PCSOs or, or specialist support staff but effectively the constabulary to have the manpower that they need to do what they need to do it is it is key I mean there is um, something called the force performance group that meets every month which is something the deputy police and crime commissioner sits on uh, led by assistant chief constable Lucy Hudson um, and they look at how many levers they've had in the last month whether it be PCSO police staff police officers reasons why are there certain parts of the business that are more vulnerable than others? Where they're looking ahead at sort of um, uh, recruitment planning for the future. Um, I mentioned the the legacy of uh, vacancy rates in in investigations. Hampshire Constabulary opened up the direct entry into investigations, so what we call a PIP one or a PIP two, so to come in and do your your exams, which the constabulary would pay for, um, not as a police officer, as a police staff, but you are still an investigator. Um, so you would carry out a murder investigation, a rape. Um, a, you know, an assault investigation, just the same as a police constable would sat next to you. But when you get to the very end and you've got your evidence and you need to go and arrest or, or charge, you would need to get your colleague to do the arrests. But other than that, they, they work the same. Um, so, yeah, so, so the Deputy Police, Con Deputy Police and Crime Commissioner sits on the force performance group every month and then feeds back to myself and Jason. We've also got staff that reporting straight into Jace on force performance as well. So... Thank you very much, Commissioner. I just uh, have a question of clarity, um, and you're not going to be surprised with a police and crime plan that has a headline of more police safe streets. We have a series of questions regarding officers and uplift. Um, the 600 is in addition to previous establishments, um, and I just wonder what date are you using as your baseline date? Not because it's not about attrition, it's about extra officers. Well, so in terms of the 600 from when? from January 2020. Brilliant, that's a really helpful point of clarity. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the series of questions, if I could uh, go to Matt first, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, mine is in a similar vein, actually. Um, I wonder if uh, the Office of the PCC would be willing to provide uh, a baseline data for uh, officers serving from 2010. I think uh, there's a, a need to kind of uh, address uh, where they were then and where we're heading now a very simple question really yes absolutely and that follows on from a point i think you made chair at the beginning or somebody asked about having the table of the numbers so yes i'm happy to share that data with you i'll take that away as a as, a, as an action point from today thank you very much next is we have dave stewart thank you chair um 
Commissioner, what assurances have you sought from the constabulary that the appropriate vetting will be undertaken when recruiting the uplift officers? Great point. Um, I've spoken to the Chief Constable about vetting since it's become a national review point. Um, and at the moment, she is waiting for national guidance uh, updates through the MPCC. Um, she is happy with the vetting the way it is done in Hampshire at the moment in that she thinks it's very comprehensive um, and she has since checked that against other constabularies obviously however if there is further guidance issued through the Home Office to the MPCC of course that will cascade down to Hampshire Constabulary but I think it is a really good point um, and I think the really key point here is is the vetting process can be one thing but it's making sure that you act on any red flags that come up you will know from PSD days that that's absolutely crucial and what we do now know with with Wayne Cousins is that I understand that when he went through vetting to join the civil nuclear division um, uh, it was recommended that he was perhaps not a suitable person but he was still given the job so it's all very well and good doing vetting but the constabulary Hampshire constabulary need to make sure that they're actually reading what comes back um, and if there are red flags making sure they're drilling down considerably um, as part of the budget process um, they have put forward a bid for an increase in staff numbers in PSD um, I think because they're anticipating the workflow coming forward I will keep you posted on that as we as we go forward brilliant thank you very much if I can move to Councillor Jeffers good morning Commissioner um, I've got a couple of questions my first is will the recruitment of the 600 officers offer an opportunity uh, for the force to be more representative of the community it serves? I really hope so, yes. And from the numbers I'm seeing at the moment, the answer to that is yes. Um, the policing minister is particularly focused on this. I think he's written a letter in January this year and he wrote another one literally two or three weeks ago to Olivia and I asking exactly uh, what the um, uh, ethnic minority uh, representative was of the constabulary. Um, we are exceeding our target. I hate quoting numbers. I'm going to say, please give me some latitude here because this may not be correct. But of our recruitment numbers, I think we are at eight and a half to nine percent ethnic minority. And as a force area, if you factor that into representative of population, it's way over where we need to be. Uh, but it's something Olivia is very focused on. Um, and perhaps if you're keen, I can share the, the exact um, ethnic minority recruitment numbers with you um, so you can see you can see that if that would be something you're interested in. That would be very helpful if we can do some sort of comparison of a, how they actually uh, match up to what the, the community is. Yes. And, and, and my second question is, um, how are expectations regarding standards of behaviour being set with new recruits? I don't know, if I'm honest. Um, I know I've had a I've had a, a presentation on on the two on the two year training program, and particularly those initial nine ten weeks when they're first in and they don't go anywhere near the public for until they understand pace and everything else. Um, about the culture and the expectations of behaviours, I know they cover something about their social media, about making sure that they have their own social media slightly locked down for security of themselves, personal security. Um, it might be I have to come back, I think I'd probably have to come back to you on that one because I genuinely don't know if there has been a shift or a change, particularly with what's gone on over the last couple of months. Yes, thank you. It'd be appreciated for that. Um, my real concern on that question is that we did have a major instance through the, um, I would say, the, uh, peer view in the Basingstoke pick. Yes. Um, so that sort of mentality is it's, we need people to say this is unacceptable and we need to root that out. I will put both of those points to ACC Lucy Hudson and ask her to come back to me and then I'll share that with all of you about both culture, particularly following on from that particular operation that you're referring to with six officers who left the uh, constabulary um, uh, and also around the, the ethnic numbers as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we've got a supplementary from Matt as well. Yeah, it was just a follow on uh, from the ethnic numbers. Uh, where are we currently? Do we know? Um, I think we are about six and a half, seven percent um, across the whole force. But again, I will get the update. The recruitment numbers are higher than the constabulary overall. So, but it, I think there is about one and a half to two percent in it. But I will clarify that for you exactly. I'm sure as well that some of the working groups will be particularly focused on that theme of work. Thank you very much. If I can go to Councillor Jones. Morning, Donna. Um, what impact is the training and in 
and the induction of the 600 new recruits expected to have on operational delivery? Well, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, um, yeah, it, it, it does have actually it does have an impact. Um, we are about to come out the back end of that now and start to see, the, as I say, the kind of the positive of having extra officers. But for the um, supervisors um, who were supervising the recruits, ideally, it's a one-on-one. -on -one, well, as in. One one uh, police officer would be supervising one person, not necessarily one on one all the time, but supervising their two year um, training period or whilst they are in the same neighbourhood team as them, whilst they are their sergeant, for example. Um, in a couple of cases, we've had to have a sergeant or a PC supervising two new recruits um, because of the sheer volume that they've come in at. Because So it, it's not been an ideal situation, but I suppose this is the downside of recruiting so many people all in one go. Um, so uh, there has been an impact. Um, I think the biggest impact from the questions I've asked and the challenge I've put is actually in neighbourhoods. Um, response and patrol tends to be given sort of the priority because you've got 909 calls outstanding right now, someone saying, I'm being stabbed, I'm being beaten up, I need help right now. Um, neighbourhoods, unfortunately, is the bit that if you're going to go and do some proactive ASB work in Millbrook and Shirley and whatever, um, actually, if you've got, you know, 60, 909, Cat 1 and Cat 2, 99 calls outstanding in Southampton right now, neighbourhoods get pulled into RMP. So those new recruits going into RMP with their supervisors, I would say less impactful. I think the biggest impact has been in neighbourhoods, and that is a challenge that I am putting back to the constabulary, which is why another reason why I set up the ASB task force, to really focus minds. Yeah, my, my concern is that, uh, I think you've touched on it, is that the housing estates and places like that where you're, not get, you're getting low-level crime, and I don't want to see that forgotten. I mean, obviously, you've got to go to the more dangerous-type situations, but I have concerns that um, while these officers are being trained, that we may be forgetting about where people live and what's actually happening out there. Yeah, and actually, going back to the previous question around culture, there is... You can focus on the negative culture that could, you know, following what happened in Basingstoke. But actually, isn't it the positive culture that we also want them to take on about being your foundation training when you become a new police officer? That actually neighbourhoods, that drip drip effect, the broken window effect, you know, the ASB, how we can see how ASB, you know, kids go in parks setting light to bus shelters or to play equipment in parks, whatever it might be, then ends up with cars being tipped over in Millbrook. It can go from one to the other within a summer, which is what's happened in parts of Southampton. Um, and, you know, so actually it is important and making sure that now the constabulary are about to get their positive outcomes of uplift from March next year, March, April next year, I really see it as my job, all of our jobs, but particularly my job in my elected role, to be challenging them to say, you've got 600 more police, we now need you. As I said to you previously, they have been focusing on high harm predominantly only. We now need medium and lower level harm too. That's what the government are giving you the 600 more officers for. That's why I'm championing you. That's why I'm going to government and batting for you to help. But you need to start addressing some of the ASB because it's a stitch in time. I believe that the demand in 101 and 999, but particularly 101, has gone through the roof because there's not enough people in neighbourhoods. So you take them out of here and all you're doing is driving up your demand here. Rebalance it and perhaps the demand in 101 will come down because we've got more preventative and a more holistic approach to the way that we are managing communities from a crime perspective. I, I completely agree with the points you're making. Thank you very much, Councillor Craig. I don't know if Sarah, Sarah looked like she indicated to come in on that. You're okay with that? Okay. Um, just wanted to check before I move on to a different point. Um, how is enhancing public confidence and trust in policing and maintaining high levels of police conduct and standards um, being considered within the plan? Yeah, it's a really good point. Um, in the plan directly, I mean, it, there is so much that you can cover. Uh, there is obviously that bit at the back which goes more into budgets, into kind of the overall performance, holding the constabulary to account. Um, perhaps that's an area where they're could have been a bit more, particularly with what's gone on over the last few months in the UK in terms of police culture. Um, so I think that's some quite, you know, good challenge and feedback there actually from you, if, if I may say so. Um, it's happening through me, you know, talking to the chief constable, having those cop sessions. I meet with her every Tuesday morning, so talking about issues that are going on. Um, there is still a lot more to be done, and I think my first six months has been getting to know my own staff, getting to know the constabulary, getting my head around the budgets, getting my head around commissioning priorities, looking at the estates issues, writing the police and crime plan. 
it's been about doing the immediate. Now I'm able to move into a new phase, um, sort of month seven onwards. And certainly I think drilling down on some of those points are going to be really, really, well, they are absolutely on my agenda and our key. So I haven't done a huge amount of that right now because of all of the other competing priorities. But, you know, even just, you know, hopefully if I have your endorsement for the plan, getting this out to the public, getting it printed, getting it sent out to everybody um, and having that there as an aid memoir that I can then use to be challenging beyond that is going to be key but also really being more specific about stuff perhaps through pdrs you know um service you know um um keep kpis that may, may need to be set with the constabulary around certain certain issues around culture and crime numbers yeah i think it's really important that, that work's done i think at the last meeting i mentioned a personal incident that i had that really not my confidence mm -hmm. with the police and i know that i'm not the only one in this room so for us to be championing the police and the police crime commissioner, it's really important that we get kind of that, that feeling of confidence. Absolutely. So I think that really, really is important. Um, just slightly different, um, because it does go on to the confidence bit. What is the difference between a 999 call and a 101 call? And I'm asking this, again, it's a personal thing. I rang to, um, to report a, I don't know whether it's stolen or whatever, but a, a moped that had been chucked in sort of just off the side of the road into some water. F I phoned 101 and it says, this is for prompt police action. Please go on the website and report it. And you think, well, if an emergency, 999, they're saying that that's emergency only, and 101 is saying that this is prompt police action only. Where do people that haven't got the internet report these things to? Yeah, it's a really good point. And the 101 service, um, when I first got elected, um, th th you know, th I think the 101 service has come a long way in credit to the constabulary, but it's still not where it needs to be. And I think perhaps the constabulary had more of a view that it was closer to where it needed to be. Uh, and the feedback that I'd had from the public is as same as you're getting all the time, either personally or through people you represent, um, is overwhelming. There is absolutely no point in reporting anything on 101. Nothing ever gets done. You never get any feedback. Uh, and, you know, this is a consequence of the constabulary moving to a high harm model only. That's, you know... People are phoning up on 101 about that medium and lower level crime and feel like they're not being listened to, which is why in my priorities, it was on there as priority number four or five. You know, improve the call handling, improve the 101 system. Um, and under that, there was another page that had the police motorbike on it, if you remember, which says, you, my success will be measured when, and there were another six or seven green sort of bullet points. And one of those was when people feel confident and happy they're being listened to and crime is being responded to and they get feedback. Because the thing is with the constabulary, and I've said this to them, and again, because they're so in their policing world, is that when someone reports a moped that's been dumped inside of a river or a wing mirror kicked off or a shed break in, you actually do do stuff with that information, but you don't tell people you're doing it. And so they think, what's the point in responding? What is the point in reporting, sorry? Um, and the people's confidence in policing has dropped, you know, it has dropped because they don't feel like they are being listened to. And actually they are, they just don't know about it. So this is why this new system they've invested in, which was hugely expensive way before my time, um, or certainly over the last 18 months, called CA. MP, customer management platform, has the, it's a very sophisticated piece of kit, and I think they're using about 60% of it at the moment, but it has the ability to not only, as I said to you before, take information in, but to give information out, but you've got to tell it to do that. You've got to tell it to go back to, if you've reported it on 101, if you've reported it on online home, which, by the way, is also not great at all. That needs a complete overhaul. Again, the Consumery thought that was better received and landing better with the public than perhaps you and I might think it is. Um, the rural community have fed back to me in spades that you can't even, we're on the drop down menu, there's not even, not all the rural crimes are even on there. Um, so there is a trial being done at the moment supported by uh, my office in terms of analyst support or about to start supporting analyst support for that for a new rural crime policing app. Part of the stuff that I want to do in terms of that pledge around improving uh, reporting of crime, core handling, and the whole 101 bit is also to develop a general crime app across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight so that you can take a picture of the moped, GPS knows exactly where you are, sends it straight in, they've got your mobile number, they can, neighbourhoods can text you back, or somebody, whoever is tasked to feed that back, say, thank you for that, we're looking into this, um, you know, and uh, we're feeding it into our neighbourhood teams in whatever area it is you live. So at least you think, 
Okay, all right, well, someone's doing something about it. But when it's taken in and that's, that's it, you never hear anything else, it's no wonder people assume nothing is being done because they don't get the feedback. So it is a piece, there is a technological solution here, um, but it's also a culture thing. It's about challenging the way that they're currently working. Our customer service often goes by the wayside in public services, doesn't it? But it is very important. Thank you very much. Simon, just before you move on, can I just give the outcome of that? I did actually stay on 101 and spoke to a call handler who said to me, it's classed as an abandoned vehicle, phone the local council. We've got to love that, haven't we? Um, I, I just want to move on quickly because I know, Donna, what you've said has provoked three supplementaries. So I've got Matt, Sarah, and then Trevor first. Matt. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, Donna. Um, back onto the contact management, I took a, a visit to uh, Southampton uh, contact management team. And uh, individually, I, I have to say they're doing amazing work there. I think they're, uh, they're, they're working um, almost as efficiently and effectively as, as is humanly possible. Um, the challenge is that even with the new IT setup that you're talking about, and even with the improvements to that IT, um, and also to uh, the way in which they do case management um, following, uh, they have individuals, uh, a team of mixed uh, police um, and staff that um, uh, look to do sort of case review for lower level uh, crime. Even with that, it was quite clear from talking to the individuals there, there's absolutely a need for a 20% uh, uplift in contact management um, in line with the 25% uplift in police. Um, I wonder if uh, you'd be willing to, um, to uh, sort of commit to that type of uplift in staff in 101. Um, because clearly that's going to be, uh, f from the perspective on the ground and talking to people uh, on, the, on the face of it, um, the best and, and the, the, the uh, way forward. Well, <clears throat> I would love to be able to direct the Chief Constable. Actually, I wouldn't because I'm not a police officer and I wouldn't know how to do that. But it would be great if I had some ability to give direction around where officers went. And I, but I, I wouldn't dream of going into that territory because it really is for the Chief Constable, for her to own and decide where her officers go. I mean, you know, I come back to the point I made and as a critical observer of the constabulary um, and someone who is here to challenge and hold them to account, um, you could put more people in 101, which, yes, I agree with you, they, they do need more help and support. They are very, very pressed and perhaps don't have the headspace to stop and think about how to resolve something before the phones are going and there's a whole load of calls stacking up, particularly on the 999 as opposed to the 101. Or I can press for better neighbourhood policing, which reduces the demand on the 101. And I think that's probably the right way. I, I think it needs both, if I'm honest with you. But I think that if you, the consequence of the model they've moved to is it's pushed up demand on 101 and online reporting and everything else. So I would like to see a, a commitment from the constabulary through the uplift to focus back on the priority of neighbour policing and the excellent work that they can do in prevention, which I think will lead to a, a reduction in the demand on 101. Um, I really do. Uh, but I, yes, I mean, it's for the, it is for the Chief Constable to decide on the 101, but she knows it's in my priority. She knows the 101 service, reviewing it, giving feedback, using CMP better, responding better, call waiting time. She knows that that is my number four, number three or number four, no, number four priority. So it's on their radar very, very much. And I will keep very focused on it, I promise you. Okay, then can we have an assurance that extra officers are not being brought in at the expense of back, -end, back office staff? because uh, I think that's a, a real concern within the constabulary. Um, I've had that at multiple levels uh, that I've spoken to, um, from inspector down to uh, the, the person answering the phone. So, um, you know, I think uh, I, I just want to have those concerns raised and maybe you can then raise them with uh, with the chief inspector. I, I just wonder whether they can leave that with you, Commissioner, because I know we'll also be focusing on the working groups about performance and measurement after your plan's been implemented. If I could move on to Councillor Vaughan. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to 101, I was contacted by a constituent recently um, with regards to a mugging that happened in Southampton, um, where I'm a councillor. And uh, he contacted 101. Um, a lady approached him for assistance. The mugger ran off with her bag. Um, the police didn't come. Um, 
he and his wife took the lady home. Um, a couple of weeks later, he found um, the, it's a conservation area in Southampton at the end of Portsmouth Road, and he was tidying it up and doing the working group that they do down there, and he found the bag. Um, obviously, the purse was gone. Um, he contacted the police. The police didn't want to know about the bag. He kept it anyway. Um, and the reason for him contacting myself is because he went to work one morning and the iron gates to his yard had been ram raided and the front of the vehicle was left behind. He went in, looked at the CCTV and saw all the information, contacted the police and the police said, it looks like the vehicle's insured, contact them, contact your insurance, whatever, and didn't want to know, so he contacted myself. I didn't know what to do, so I contacted Chair, and Chair helped me and told me what to do and contact the district, district commander, as I did, and the email I received back was, he had looked at the details of it and the information from the police that gave to my constituent was the correct information and they weren't interested. So they didn't go out to this gentleman, didn't retrieve the CCTV the gentleman had, and weren't looking into it, nothing. Um, so I sent an email back to district commander, very strongly worded that I wasn't impressed, um, et cetera, et cetera. Sent an email to my constituent to arrange a coffee and say that I'm very sorry, but this is the outcome. And um, next thing I know is I received an email back from my constituent a couple of days later saying that the police had actually contacted him. Whether it's off the back of my strongly worded email or not, I've got no idea. The car's stolen um, and all the rest of it, but it's a bad taste in the mouth, Commissioner. Extremely bad. How can nobody want to know anything about a mugging? Don't go and see this lady. Don't go and see this man when he's had his property broken into 3,000 pounds worth of damage. Nobody is interested. I would just think that it's just, to be honest, diabolical. And I just think we need to be better at this. And I contacted the district commander. Nobody's interested. Yeah, again, before you respond, because I'm really conscious of time, uh, I, I just want to summarise where we're at, really, because the reality is near that, and, and I know you know this as a previous councillor commissioner, that it's, it's very easy for people to contact us and for us to realise that something hasn't been dealt with properly. And it's a really easy for us to intervene in a process and, and something happens. And there's a reality about that, that actually what I and I think other members don't want to happen is somebody gets a contact from a senior officer to try and placate, and we've made contact, that's a good thing, but actually it makes no difference to the process, but, which is really interesting for us as panel members, because actually, does it get, a, it does it get a, an, an action? Yes, it does, but actually does it make any difference to the crime reporting? Yes. And actually what happens to the victim, it doesn't. And, and I'm, I'm sure everybody on this panel can give us some examples of that, of what's happened in their casework. So I, I leave that with you, um, because I just want to be really clear, that we just need to be really focused on time so we get our broad range of questions answered. Um, Councillor Cartwright. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, mine's an example, I think, once again, of 101 and feedback in that respect. Um, I was a victim of crime in January, um, and, you know, use 101, and I've got to say the service was excellent at that stage, so no, no quibbles there at all. Since then, the local police um, have spoken to me, and apparently this particular crime has escalated quite considerably now, and that uh, a detective across three counties is dealing with it who promised would come back to me. That was five months ago. Since then, there's been a further 24 cases that uh, has, has happened, and the reason I know that is because it's reported in the Sunday Telegraph. And I guess the point I'm making Hang is... Hang on a minute. Didn't your commissioner get involved in that as well and tell you about it and got the, got the detective involved in it? Because I heard it on Radio Salem. Well, <laughs> you forgot my part in that bit, Councillor right. Cartwright. I, I was going to come on to that. And that, that <laughs> was really a part that worked extremely well. But, you know, and I had the local police who, who came in. Sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to sort of go on about this, but I think it's important that mm. this is now not a petty crime. Mm -hmm. It's a serious crime. Yeah. And I will th imagine the, the value of the, the um, watches that have been stolen is probably around about 
near probably half a million pounds yeah. now, actually. And to my way of thinking is, I've got a picture of the individual and everything else, but I'm having no feedback whatsoever. And, you know, and I think that's probably, if you like, an example of something that perhaps was you know, a petty crime to start with, but isn't anymore. And I understand with the police that, you know, they have to deal with petty and serious ones, but it's getting that, you know, it's the feedback, I guess, at the end of the day. But I'd also like to thank you for your help on it as well. Thank you. I'm prompted. Um, yeah, I mean, it's robbery. I think it's serious. I think it's really serious what happened to you. Um, and it was incredibly deceptive. It wasn't an obvious robbery. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it is spanning, as I understand, several counties um, and two particular or a group of Eastern European women that are doing this across the country. Um, I mean, I'm very happy to chase up for you and anyone else if you want. So, I mean, the scenario you've given Councillor Vaughan, that is what my post bag is full up with every single week. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and explain away what the Cantabria are doing because it's not my job, but I will take it away for you because I am, like you, a member of the public who is elected to hold them to account. I am not here to say, well, what we're doing is... It's not my job. My job is to say, what are you going to do about it to the Chief Constable? What are you going to do? What is investigations going to do? What's your lead head of crime going to do? How are we addressing this? How are we going to start giving people feedback? How are you going to reduce the number of released under investigation cases? How are we going to make sure that we're getting prosecutions moving forward quicker? But uh, the feedback is incredibly valuable because hearing the real life stories, knowing what's going on, which is why I gave a thank you to the members of the public who've been brave enough to reach out to me and share that some of them, particularly when you come to exploitation, some of the very, very serious cases that are going on across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight um, are, are heartbreaking. Um, and actually, if you are that lady who was robbed, um, <sighs> The impact of someone walking towards you that looks like the person that robbed you, every time your heart will stop, you know, you'll start, the impact on victims is, is considerable. One thing I can do as commissioner, particularly, is to be supporting victims. That is my job. Um, and I'm about to, <laughs> once we've got some of this stuff put to bed and I can move on, is to start really looking and drilling down at what services we are providing to victims. Um, and there is a big... Uh, contract that's coming up for renewal next year so I really want to look at again how I can really make sure that we are supporting people in the way we need to. Thank you Commissioner. Um, Dave you've got a comment. Um, yeah this is a comment that follows on from your list that you're now going to over with the Chief Constable. Um, in addition to the 600 more police officers uh, can I ask you to ensure support for the Chief Constable to address any deficit <coughs> excuse me in detective numbers which is currently a national concern. Um, you don't need to respond to that. I think it naturally follows and it is an important area, especially when you've uh, outlined all the points you're covering. Can, would you mind for 30 seconds if I do? No, no, I'm just... Sorry, chair's, only because the chair's giving me a guide. And a and just so everybody knows, I'm really conscious of time and I know we, we've got a lot of questions so that we get a really broad coverage of the, the plan. Yeah. It's a really big issue, and you're saying about ensuring support for her. That is in train right now. So in our one-to-one -one two or three weeks ago, I said to her, I'm concerned about the 40% vacancy rate we're carrying in investigations. I know there's a direct entry recruitment process going on right now. Is it enough? What can I do to help you? It might be with money for billboards, bus stops, blah, 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 blah. What more can we do? Perhaps linking up with the military, ex-military intelligence that are really good people that are retiring in their early mid-40s. What can I do to help you? Because I really think that this hiatus that we have in investigations is obviously coming from the fact that there aren't enough staff in investigations. I specifically said to her, in the budget that you have allocated from me each year, um, does that cover if you were able to go out and recruit all the vacancies you have across the three picks and investigations, do you have the budget there to do that? In what? And she said, yes, I do. So, okay, fair enough. So, it, and she's looking, she's coming back to me right now, literally, uh, she, I had an email yesterday or day before, uh, update to say, I'm, I'm coming back to you on, on what our recruitment plan is around investigation. So that is a very pertinent question and it is something that I'm, I'm pushing on at the moment. Perfect. We'd love to see that and the conversation that we have about numbers, Donna, that would be great. Chair, can I just make a suggestion? I know that time and we've got all these questions, but I think every one of these questions is really important. So any that don't get answered, because I know that there's another meeting after this, that we do have them sent to Donna and get written replies? Yeah, no, absolutely, we can do that. Um, and, and also, we, we may be able to con curtail how we ask the questions and maybe shorten the response, Commissioner. Brilliant. If I can move to Councillor Baines. 
Thank you, Chair. I'll try and be speedy, speedy quick. Um, Don, I'm really, really impressed with um, your draft plan, um, as, as we've um, had presented to us today. It's measurable, uh, it's clear, and it's really transparent. So uh, congratulations on that aspect. My question's around um, something important to all of our residents, I think, and that's policing visibility. So one thing your plan doesn't touch upon is how will you measure and demonstrate improved policing visibility? So the measurement of that will be through the um, how you can judge my success. That page will be around the confidence in policing going up and around people telling me when we are surveying them using YouGov, who we use regularly, and other consultation methods for people to say, yes, we feel we're seeing the police more. That's how I'll be measuring that. Um, so I need to work with the constabulary on how we achieve that. I've got a couple of ideas at the moment which are very embryonic, but yeah, it's a really good point and it is number two priority because I think people need to see the police more to feel safer. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Councillor Baines. Um, if we can move to uh, Councillor McKenney. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Well, in fact, good afternoon now, isn't it, of course? Good afternoon, Donna. Um, yes, congratulations from me as well. And also for the fast pace of your work. I think it's incredible what you've actually done in the short period of time that you've been elected. Um, I'll keep this really uh, short because I think we've, we've actually touched on this by supplementary questions already from, from uh, other uh, uh, colleagues. Um, will action be taken through the plan to, um, to enable officers to attend more reported crimes which are currently not considered high harm? And that's back to those points around me challenging around the uplift and now responding to medium and lower level harm. It's really about that is the absolute crux of the point you've raised there, which is a really good one. You're obviously recognising that there is not enough put into that emphasis. Um, and that's why neighbourhoods are so important, um, as are getting these uplift numbers through. So RMP have enough ability to respond to things quickly, but very much including that medium and lower level harm as well, following on from the point that Vicky made around the, you know, the, the point that she raised and the issue that she raised. Um, so so, yeah, it, it's about me pressing them on how they're going to use the uplift numbers. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And if I just may add a comment, Commissioner, uh, I, I think it won't be a surprise to you that some people may see uh, an objective about visibility of policing as something that could be perceived as something which is superficial. And I think what, comment sorry? would be superficial about visibility. Yes. And so actually, just to reiterate that point as a comment, that obviously we'll be incredibly focused on what that means as far as increased levels of investigation, charging and conviction, Absolutely. because there's, there's something about making sure that it really does make a difference. If we can then move on to questions, and I've got Councillor Beavis. Yes, Commissioner, in your uh, improving visibility of policing, uh, you have a statement here to work with local councils to increase the number of third-party reporting centres to allow victims of hate crime uh, to make reports in multiple locations. Um, and my question is really, before considering this um, increase of third-party reporting centres, how do you assess both the effectiveness and um, the visibility of these centres and how will this be monitored going forward? And the reason for my question is that we have two third party visibility centres in Gosport, uh, one of which is in the uh, Discovery Centre, which is no longer operating. Um, and and uh, do you monitor the numbers of people who go in? How, is, how effective are these um, centres? Thank you very much. Well, the work to monitor, see what the effectiveness is, how many we've got, if they're operational and still open, is a joint piece of work between the constabulary and my office. So my office will be uh, monitoring where they are and how many reports are coming in. They monitor how many hate crime reports are made each year. Through the survey work that we do, which goes on literally continually all the time, um, through the comms team who lead on that, working very closely with the, with the OPCC performance team, and force performance, we can see uh, the feedback that come from, particularly when you talk to victims of crime who perhaps are from a um, from a, a, um, a, a BAME community. When you speak to them about their experience of reporting crime and being a victim, very often the propensity to reach out to the police for help is, is, is quite low in some communities, as you know, hence the need for third-party reporting centres. So one of the things the constabulary are quite keen on, and so are we, that we increase the number, 
And of course, if you're doing that, we need to be monitoring the effectiveness of it. So we will monitor the effectiveness by feedback from those victims after they've reported and their experience of that. Um, and also we're giving greater consideration to victim advocates, if that's the right word, um, particularly when it comes to rape and serious sexual assault. There is a national review at the moment and Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabularies, Sir Tom Windsor, has recommended in his report to the government that there are victim advocates for all rape and serious sexual assault offences. So you have someone who stays with you throughout the whole journey, including when you go to court. Um, and that would probably be an integrated sexual violence advisor who I commissioned through my office here in Hampshire. Um, but we should probably have that for all crimes. And, you know, hate crimes, particularly if you've got people that are very vulnerable. We had those gold thefts in Basingstoke, um, as you'll know, very targeted to specifically a Sikh, was, I think it was Sikh community, wasn't it? Um, and that's there's a couple of Sikh ladies who were robbed in their homes, uh, horrendous cases. Um, and actually their propensity to reach out to the police would not have been the automatic natural first thing they did. Um, it might be to go to you know, a faith leader in their own community first. So it's about making sure that there is that right link up um, to get the crimes reported and to put the support necessary around it. But how we measure that will be surveying, talking and working with the force on that as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, you touched on um, violence reduction units, uh, and I wondered what you would articulate as your level of commitment, considering um, the unknown entity as far as central government funding. Yeah, it's considerable as well. <laughs> as you know, three quarters of a million pounds, so it's not cheap, um, but absolutely essential. And actually, I think what you're getting at there perhaps is if, what would I do if the funding wasn't there? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think th the constabulary, I think, would, would move the deck chairs around to make sure that the VRU continued or VRUs continued, uh, particularly covering the two cities where we have got, you know, uh, exploitation, drugs and gun crime growing in one area and knife crime with youths and stabbing each other and robberies in, in another area of, in terms of the two cities. Different growing issues, um, but both of them absolutely right and proper that the violent reduction units are, are monitoring those and managing, particularly those highest risk offenders. So if the funding was taken away, uh, if I got told now it was going to go next year, I think there are things in, some ideas I have right now where I could find the money to fund that um, in perpetuity, and it would certainly be a priority for me. Brilliant, thank you very much. If I can go to Councillor Beavis again. Um, yes, uh, Donna, you actually have answered in, in, your, um, in, in your introduction um, much about uh, the ASB task force, which mm. I'm, I'm very interested in. And, and you said you will give us an update on that. It's meeting again in December. You also mentioned invest, uh, investing in new projects and so perhaps when we have that update we could mm -hmm. you could give us an idea of what those projects are and where we're going with that so I, I don't need any other answer to it at the moment thank absolutely. you absolutely brilliant thank you very much if i can go to matt next then please hi donna thank you again um <clears throat> you've made a commitment to uh, be tough on uh, unauthorized encampments um as a local authority member, I'd be quite interested in, in understanding um, how you're going to reach out to local authorities. Um, you mentioned a, a while ago about um, transit sites. Uh, just wondered how that piece of work was going. As you know, the police um, are limited with powers if they don't have somewhere to signpost um, those illegal encampment uh, occupants to. Just wondered how that piece of work was, was going. Thank you very much. Well, the initial piece of work reaching out, as you, would, as you referred to, as I updated the panel previously, about speak, work, trying to work across peace with all councils to find a solution that might work for all of us collectively, excluding the Isle of Wight here for a moment, because you know, the, the propensity for uh, caravans to travel across the water for, uh, for not good purposes um, is, is much lower than, you know, they don't have the big issue that we have over here on the mainland. Um, so the piece of work I did around that and testing the water and also the work that was done with Op Gossamer. If you remember the, literally about a month after I was elected with the, the sulky racing that was happening on the A33 down the spine from Basingstoke down to Winchester. And the work that was done by the constabulary there and credit where credit's due, they, they responded brilliantly to that. I think 
was a stitch in time to prevent a whole load of other stuff that I think was coming our way over the summer. And I think the traveller community and those that, that arrange these illegal races um, on the highway thought, hmm, perhaps we'll go somewhere else then because it looks like Hampshire are about to take a much tougher stance or have taken a much tougher stance. Now, coming back to the encampments, I was a lot of the work I was doing around speaking to every single council in Hampshire and the other way, and by that I mean districts and unitaries and the county, um, was to formulate part of what was going into the plan. I knew it was a priority. I've heard the casework. I've, I've read it. I've met with residents. I've heard from all of you as councillors. I've been a council leader myself. I know what a pain this is and how much money, public money, it's costing. So to have that as a really robust pledge in my plan that's why i did that water testing with all of you and just to see how where you're at since then there hasn't been anything else that's gone on because i've been working on getting this finished getting it done what's now going to happen of course is when i move into the new chapter once the plan is signed off and published is we then move into the delivery and that's when i'll be able to give you a better update on that if that's okay brilliant thank you very much um I wonder if I could, you've talked us through um, a lot of enhancements and conversations and, and where the current situation is for the wider criminal justice system, Donna. Uh, I wanted to just expand that a bit, thinking about some of the things that we've heard from our engagement with the consultation that's happened about previous precepts with the members of the public. Um, we started to hear quite loudly conversations about uh, why is the Commission talking about youth services and mental health when I thought I paid different taxes to cover those services? And I wondered how you could assure residents that the monies collected through your part of precept are contributed directly to deliver things that they would expect you to deliver and what you're doing to hold other public services to account for things that they should deliver. Um, well, that's a tricky one because they were pledges made before my time by a previous commissioner uh, between a negotiation between him and the chief constable on the police precept. Um, and uh, I suppose really whether I think they got those pledges and priorities right is largely academic now because they were made. Uh, and they were made, you know, I think probably to you in, in the meeting that happened earlier this year. Um, so, yes, I have reviewed um, the pro or the pledges and, and the, the points that the Chief Counsel have previously made in response to what the public would get for their £15 precept. Um, that, you know, the ongoing discussions with the constabulary around the forced performance of how they are delivering on pledges made previously is part of the ongoing work that I have. Um, it's, it's COPs, it's, month, it's weekly meetings, it's monthly forced performance. That's how we are um, challenging and, and delivering through. I mean, I think that there are... Uh, my priorities are going to be new from my budget, which is coming up in the next couple of months, and, and overlaying the police and crime plan on top of that. So when you put the two things together, um, looking at whether or not we have a police precept and what we're going, what bang we're going to get for our buck in terms of that new money, factoring in my priorities. Um, I get the point you're making. We can't forget what's already been agreed and already been collected in terms of taxes earlier this year in April. So, uh, yes, ongoing conversations. I think, you know, I'm, I'm hoping with your support, um, I'll be able to uh, bring the Chief Constable with me at your invitation to uh, the budget meeting so that we can have these discussions with her because clearly they were her pledges. And I think it's right and proper that, you know, through me and through all of you, um, we hold to account on the delivery of those things. I just want to go back to a very specific point, which is thinking about members of the public who we're representing to scrutinise you, some of that concern, whether it's past commissioners or I suspect current commissioner, will also be a concern when you will talk about your passion for adverse childhood experiences, youth mm. services, how mental health impacts mm. on the criminal justice system. But as a taxpayer, I could be very concerned about that being some coming out of a different part of the tax that I pay, not the money that you get. Well, my part of the delivery of those will come out of the bit that I get. So, yes, I'll be, I see what you're saying. It's about, it's about scope creep, really. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that what I am pledging, I can deliver on. I think that I, I, there is nothing that I have sat there and s said, either in writing online or in this plan, that I don't think can be done through the work. I mean, I've managed to secure £460,000 um, in September with the uh, MOJ saying we've got some money, it must be spent by the 31st of March, and that was for trauma-informed work. As a consequence, 17,000 people across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, practitioners, health visitors, midwives, um, teachers, uh, GPs, are being trained in trauma-informed work from a, a 
chance windfall £460,000 that my office secured on trauma-informed work in September. We've got to get it spent and out of the door by the 31st of March, and that is going on right now. 17,000 professionals across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. So I'm very confident that through my own direct work, I am able to demonstrate what I will do for the pledges I'm making. I don't know if that's answered your question. I know Dave wants to make a comment. Uh, it is purely a comment. Um, I'll set through a number of the um, police and crime panel budget meetings and precept setting meetings, as are many colleagues around the room. And this is probably one area where people do very much scrutinise not only what is asked for, <coughs> but what has been delivered in the past. So although you're absolutely right, it's not your, um, uh, in the right words, um, this was set before you were in post. I'm just making the comment, I think it would be very useful to be able to cover those points when you present your budget bid in the new year or whenever, because I think members will want to know what happened, having on behalf of the public asked for that £15 a month, a, a year or whatever. Um, I think people, we should be able to account for that and explain it. And, and already listening to you, you're going to be able to do that and more. So I think for the record, it'd be a good thing to do. Thank you. And just to add, I think what's difficult about that is some of those pledges came very publicly from the Chief Constable. So therefore, as a member of public, I might expect you to hold the Chief Constable to account for those pledges that she made for a precept increase in a financial year, which you're holding her to account on. I agree. Just to be very clear on that. Um, Ken. greater communication with the uh, local residents. Many of us in this room, in fact, I should imagine all of us in this room, certainly that represent our residents, have pockets of residents who are hard to reach, who feel disenfranchised, yet are often <coughs> the keyboard warriors, often the, the community leaders for negative um, uh, comments and, and, and opinions. How do you propose to meet with those groups? Um, what, what do you mean, the keyboard warriors or just the kind of hard to reach groups? The hard to reach, but well, they're often the same bunch. Yeah, um, I think the, hard to reach, the hardest to reach groups for me are often pensioners. <coughs> you know, people that are online, um, I, can, I can normally, tentacles can get to them, even if they are um, the protagonists that perhaps don't like me. Um, in the Donna, Jan Donna Jones anti-fan club, as I call them. Um, you know, so those people are often watching me much closer than even supporters of mine watch me. Uh, very often that is the case. Um, so I think for me, it's probably those that are older or with learning disabilities or people, or English isn't their first language. It is a challenge. It's a real challenge. Um, I think working with parish councils are key um, and town council. I went and spoke at the Hampshire Association of Local Council's AGM last Saturday um, in Chilworth at, at the Hilton there um, and you know we've got oh God, I think it's probably 50 60 parish councils we've got loads of parish councils in Hampshire they're all represented um, through that body which is really good so it's really good to go and talk to them and the feedback I got was very different to what I would get if I was talking to a district councillor or a unitary councillor who understands things from a sees things through a different lens um, different challenges different budgets different priorities um, it is an issue I think I need to consider continue to be out there I was on the Isle of Wight again yesterday uh, meeting with you know Isle of Wight search and rescue meeting with victims meeting up with people who've got issues um, being seen being in public places I think supermarkets are a good way to catch up with uh, elderly people who perhaps don't engage on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram or on those other ways um, encouraging people to sign up to my newsletter because then I can send them things and it, let them know what I'm doing or what help and support is there and also doing beat surgeries you know working with working with the constabulary where there's an issue getting out there and meeting people at a beat surgery with a local inspector and a couple you know a sergeant and a couple of the PCSOs and, and PCs that's another really good way to do it because there's nothing that motivates people more than coming out when there's an actual issue me being there and listening to that as well as the police and watching how the police are interacting with them is key but it's a challenge it really is and it's something i have to constantly keep thinking about yeah thank you brilliant thank you very much if i can go to councillor beavis yes donna uh, i mentioned to you in the financial working group some concerns over Opera operation magenta yeah. which is the investigation into the deaths at gosport war memorial hospital 
and the, the figure that's being quoted is from your budget is £2 million per year for a three-year period. It is a significant amount of money. Now, how will this affect your plans or, or your ability to deliver your plan? And I know that you said at the Financial Working Group that you were going to the Home Office to take this up with them. Do you think you will be successful in the, your visit to the Home Office in getting this charge taken away from your budget? And is there any way that this panel can support you in this? Thank you very much. Um, so do I think I'll be successful? Um, if I'm honest, unlikely. Um, I'd probably put my chances at 40 to 50 percent at best uh, because it's me versus a government department and ultimately the Treasury. Um, if this was a national publicly ordered inquiry such as Hillsborough, of course there is a different funding package. This isn't. This is being treated as a murder investigation and therefore the responsibility, as you know, falls on the Chief Constable. Now, that £2 million a year that we are paying is only uh, 50 to 60 percent of the cost the large majority of, no, beg your pardon, it's 40% of the cost. The largest majority of the money, as you know, with Opmagenta at the moment, is actually coming from a Home Office grant, not because it's a national public inquiry, but because of the significance of this being Britain's largest murder investigation, which I don't want to use uh, evocative words, but it, it potentially is, um, if we... If we get to where we think might, might come with the numbers of victims that have been identified at the moment, which are huge. Um, I have written to the Home Secretary, as you know, about the letter that they wrote to us saying that they were going to phase back their funding towards this incredibly large murder investigation. We are currently contributing towards funding a hundred, over a hundred investigators, which Kent Constabulary are uh, currently have working on Op Magenta. Um, it is a huge, huge financial problem for us and of course a humanitarian in terms of the families of the victims um, and what's gone on with the disgraceful and appalling behavior that that and the criminality the, the sheer volume and level of criminality that I think is coming out of the investigation is horrendous um, there is a big update due in the next couple of weeks by um, Deputy Chief Constable Neil Jerome, who is leading this for Hen uh, Kent Constabulary. He's a Met Police officer who is his Deputy Commissioner of the Met, who is in Kent Constabulary undertaking the investigation on behalf of Olivia Pinckney. He reports back to Olivia and gives me regular updates, as well as you're probably aware. Um, Bishop uh, James Jones has also been involved, uh, particularly leading on behalf of representing the victims. And there was a big victims meeting that took place via a teleconference about six weeks ago to update them on where we're at. The coroner has opened um, the inquiries and automatically adjourned them until the end of the police investigation. If this goes all the way, I think we're looking at another three to four years. However, uh, it, it may not, it depends on what happens and there is an update in the next couple of weeks um, and I'm waiting. I've written to the Home Office as a cursory reply to the letter I got to say, not happy, we, this, this is not a sustainable position for Hampshire Constabulary. Um, but until I've had this next update, which is due first or second week of December, uh, that's the point upon which I then need to make a key decision about whether or not I take, you know, what I do next. So I'm waiting on Neil Jerome's uh, update this due before I can then take that forward with the Home Secretary in terms of those conversations. Thank you very much. Councillor Ashmore. Hi, Lara. <laughs> Hello. Uh, hopefully this one shouldn't be uh, too arduous, uh, but I've noticed the plan document itself doesn't make clear the period which the plan's to cover, the 21 to 24. Uh, so I'm just wondering, if is that made transparent elsewhere in the materials regarding this, or could you put something in it before it goes to press? Yeah, it is until 2024. Um, it's in the covering report that's before you today, isn't it? I, didn't, I don't know if it was... I'll have a look, Dave, if that's all right. <laughs> it's oh, one that, of those great things. Take away. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, perhaps it should be in the opening gown bit. I'll look at that one if that's okay. I'll do that as a takeaway. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Councillor Bailey's got supplementary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And um, as, a, as a newbie to this panel, I found this morning very uh, informative and congratulate uh, the Commissioner for the, um, the clarity in the, in the document, which I found very useful. Um, 
the question I had, and it relates to the period of, of, of which the plan is over, has some work been done to pull together a baseline of the measures that you are going to be reviewing so, so that you've got the baseline of all of the where we are at the moment or at the beginning of the period so that it's easy as we go through the period for us to, to look back and see how, how things have moved forward. Yes, absolutely. So there's two real key analytical tools we use. The force used something called force BI. Um, sorry. Uh, the force is just introducing something called power BI. Power BI. Um, and they also have um, some other metrics systems that um, we'll be able to draw on as well. And through our office, we use something called um, adapt, no, Interact. I can't, oh, can't want to say inept, sorry. In, yeah, no, it's, uh, definitely it's not in, It's not inept. Definitely I began with an I, I was thinking, what's the word? Yeah, interact. And it's a fantastic um, tool that the performance team in my office, the analysts in my office, have pulled together to put in everything from, you know, all the crime stats and everything that comes out of the ONS and the home office monthly figures that come out all get fed into there. That is a key metrics for us to use. And we're reviewing all the pledges in here as we go forward quarterly, monthly, we, you know, literally to work out are we delivering this? Is this going in the right direction? What are the force doing? And so we use both bits of information to challenge back to them. Brilliant. Chair, can I, sorry, I'm conscious these are um, conscious the sure commission and not me, really. I'm conscious that some of these issues will have been discussed um, at various police and crime uh, panel meetings previously, uh, for example, rural crime. So I'm also very keen to kind of track back and see, uh, use those as baseline so that we can again demonstrate the difference that's been made during um, the Commissioner's tenure. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful, Jason. I think it's it's always very useful, particularly when we've had about 50% change in the panel, because we've done a lot of work in our um, proactive scrutiny, which really helps understanding what communities' views are about lots of things that appear as your priorities, Donna. Um, moving on from that, because there is something about monitoring performance, and of course that's crucial to our role, is when will you, when do you think uh, uh, an implementation plan will be available for the plan working group for the next level down underneath your plan? Um, I would think that we should be able to be in a position to share that with you, hopefully by February, once we've broken the back of the budget, because at the moment I'm, my diary is just now, as you can imagine, consumed with budget meetings. We had a big one this week with like 12 of us in the room, because you've obviously got the force, constabulary finance team, my finance team, uh, you know, the chief officer team also involved in those, those meetings. So between now and February, really, it's, it's, we're consumed by the budget, but we have got work going on behind the scenes in terms of developing implementation stuff. So I'd hope to be able to get that to you probably, yeah, I would imagine as soon as the budget's done, February, March time. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, and one final comment for me on the plan, which is um, there have been quite a lot of commitments made to spend an investment and I think there's just a, a comment that I would reiterate about actually of course we will be very focused on what the return on that investment has been I, I use the contact management platform as it's one of those subjects that's come quite a lot up today as far as the 101 and the management of that because it was a significant spend it was a significant overspend um, we, we as a panel previously had quite a, a, a a long um, investigation to understanding how it works and, and what it was supposed to deliver. And I think there's something about making sure that we get to see that it's delivered everything that it was supposed to deliver, such a large investment. I don't know whether anybody else has got any final comments or questions before we move on for the commissioner. No, in that case, thank you very much, commissioner. Uh, thank you, Jason. Um, and I'm sure we'll see you later this afternoon. Yes, Brilliant. thank you very thank much. Thank you. Um, so we've got a recommendation in front of us, which is that the panel has wants to review the draft police and crime panel and, and makes such reports and recommendations upon it um, as we consider appropriate. Uh, I just want to see whether we're, we're happy to ac accept the, the report. Agreed. Agreed, everybody? No dissenters? Sorry, Chair, was that with the comments that had been made for yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, agree then. Is that all right? And, and I know Caroline will sort of collect some of our responses and send that through to the office. Is that okay? Brilliant. I have to find my bit of paper now. So then moving on to um, item eight, we've got uh, a, a, a paper here from Caroline about our sub-working groups and where we've got a vacancy and we were talking about uh, Mark no longer being a member 
of New Forest District Council. Any comments or questions for Caroline about the paper? No? Uh, I just wonder whether we need to make some appointments, Caroline, because I know we need to appoint Sarah to the plan working group. Any other appointments or anybody else wants to put them forward, sales forward for any vacancies? Caroline's just reminding you we've got a, a vacancy in finance and one in the Equalities and Diversity Working Group. Nobody wants to put themselves forward for the vacancies. In that case, can we accept the report? Everybody agreed? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Then we just go on to the work programme. Again, we've got uh, a paper which outlines that for the municipal year in uh, pages 43 and 48. Any questions for Caroline on the paper? No, in that case, are we happy to adopt it? Everybody agreed? No dissenters? No. If that is the case then, um, that formally concludes our meeting for today. And I, if I could ask for the webcast to be finished. <coughs> and